Wheaties presents Dimension X. Adventures in time and space. Transcribed in future tense. Dimension X. On stage tonight, Dimension X. Another in the Wheaties' big parade of exciting half-hour presentations. I'm thinking of a girl... Very pleasant person, very attractive, too. She has cool hands, a nice voice, and a gentle manner. She's crisp and efficient, but she needs help badly. She's the American nurse, and her problem is this. There just aren't enough like her to go around. Not enough nurses for the hundreds of important nursing careers now open in hospitals, industry, research, the armed forces, and private duty. Now, you may not know the girl I mentioned, but perhaps you know someone very much like her. A young girl with at least a high school diploma of good health and character. If you do, tell her this. America needs 50,000 student nurses this year. Tell her you think she might be one of them. If she agrees, have her stop in at the hospital nearest to her. She'll never regret it, and neither will you. Now, tonight's adventure into the world of the unknown. The world of Dimension X. The doll shop stood on a quiet Washington side street, not too far from a sprawling Pentagon building. A woman and a child waited outside, the little girl peering eagerly through the window at the doll's inside, and the woman glancing impatiently at her wristwatch as if expecting someone who was late for an appointment. And there was nothing about the doll shop to warn them that they were waiting to keep an appointment with doom. Oh, Mommy, look! Yes, what is it, dear? In the window of the shop, the tiny dolls. Oh, Mommy, do you think Daddy will buy me one? Well, we'll ask him when he comes, dear. He said three o'clock on this corner. I see him, Mommy. There he is. Oh, Henry, here we are. Hello, dear. Hi. Sorry I'm late. Well, we've been waiting for you. Cindy's been so. I'm afraid I'll have to call off the shopping, Elma. Oh, Henry, we promised. Yes, I know. I'm sorry. It's just one of those things. You've been the wife of an army colonel long enough to know his life isn't his own. What is it this time? Oh, some more of that flying sphere nonsense. The pilot who says he sighted it last month crashed and was killed today, so the general wants a full report. Dear, what next? Daddy. Well, I have a staff meeting at the Pentagon at 3.15. Daddy, look in this window. Oh, I haven't time, dear. Just for a minute, Daddy, please. Cindy, I haven't time to stop and watch a bunch of six-inch dolls parading around in the shop. <laughs> Say, they are lifelike, aren't they? <laughs> look at that, Alma. Dolls are marching around like a regular review. <laughs> They've even got their own little band. Henry, your staff meeting. Hmm? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yes, I've got to run. Now, look, don't go spending a lot of money on that nonsense, Alma. <laughs> no, dear. Bye. Bye, dear. Bye, Cindy. Bye, Daddy. Oh, Mommy, look. Look, the band's going to play. Well, <laughs> aren't they wonderful, honey? You know, it's funny. I must have stood on this corner a thousand times, and I've never even noticed this shop before. Good evening, children. Oh, uh, well... Well, good evening. <laughs> Mommy, he talks awful funny. Hush, Cindy. Would you like to step inside the shop of San Torferigi? Well, yes, we would. This way. Oh, Mommy, it's like... It's like Fairyland. Here in the shop of San Torferigi, creator of Perigi's universal, wonderful dolls, the world of adult reality is blended with the world of child's fantasy. This is a new shop, isn't it, Mr. Parigi? What is new and what is old? Come, this way. Would you like to meet one of my little ones? Oh, yes. This one in the red jacket is Toto. Speak, little one. How do you do? How do you do? Yeah, isn't How do you that do? wonderful? Mommy, he talks the doll talk. Amazing. It's absolutely amazing. That is nothing for Parigi's wonderful dolls. Listen, sing, Toto. Sing for the little girl. My name is Toto. They listen. Sing, Toto. Men are big and tall. Dolls are very small. When men begin to fall, the dolls will roll them all. Oh, Lord, Mr. Toto, more. Well, how do they work, Mr. Perigi? How do they work? Ah, that is the secret of the great Perigi, greatest of all doll masters. 
To make an ordinary doll is nothing. <laughs> to make a perfect replica, that is something. But to make a doll with intelligence, that is the work of an artist, huh? Well, yes. Well, they must be very expensive. Madame, when I construct a doll like Toto, I cannot bear to be parted from him permanently. So instead of selling, I rent my little people. You rent dolls? Precisely. Ten dollars. I have but one request. When you grow tired of my dolls, you must return to me in good condition. Oh, Mommy, could we take him home? Take him home! Take him home! Take him home! <laughs> oh, look, Mommy, look! He's bowing and dancing. <laughs> oh, Mommy, he wants to come. Please, I'll take such good care of it, please. Well, honey, we'll, we'll have to deal with your father later, but... Well, oh, Mommy! All right, wrap him up, Mr. Parigi. Oh, dear, I have a feeling when your father comes home, we'll be sorry. Be sorry, be sorry, be sorry, be sorry! <laughs> now, Toto, this is my room, and, and you're going to sleep right here next to my pillow. <laughs> oh, Toto, don't laugh like that. I'm going to have to teach you some manners. <laughs> You be quiet, because my daddy will be home soon, and he's a colonel in the army, and, and he'll bust you to private if you don't behave. Now, you wait here. I'm going to introduce you to my puppy dog, Mr. Blister. So be good now. Here, Blister. Here, Blister. Come on, Blister. Come here. Mr. Blister, now this is Toto. Oh, dear, I don't think Mr. Blister likes you too. Stop it, Mr. Blister. Come over here and shake hands with Toto, Mr. Blister. Come on now. Let go, let go, let go. Mr. Blister, come over here. Why, what happened, dear? Mr. Blister tried to bite my doll. Look how frightened Toto is. Dolls don't get frightened, Cindy. But he is, Mommy. He screamed. You just imagined it, honey. But he did. He did. Well, Mr. Blister didn't mean it. You know he's the gentlest little pup alive. He isn't. He's nasty and I hate him. <laughs> Cindy, you've hurt his feelings. Okay. He tried to buy my new doll, and I don't ever want to see him again. Ever. Oh, dear. All right, Mr. Blister. You come downstairs with me. Come on now. Cindy's angry at you tonight. I'll kill him. Why, Cindy... Where did you... Where did you hear a thing like that? Toto said it. Well, you, I see. Well, you've had an exciting day, honey. You brush your teeth now and go to bed. Daddy's coming home late, so we'll see you in the morning. Hmm? Good night, darling. Sleep well. I hate him, Mr. Toto. I hate him. Morning, Alma. Breakfast ready? Just a minute. How was the staff meeting last night, dear? Oh, horrible bore as usual. Where's the little one? Up in her room. She'll be down in a minute. Oh, sir, remind me to take some papers back to the war department, will you? Mm -hmm. I left them in my strong box. Henry? Hmm? You told me it was against regulations to bring secret papers home. Well, I had to finish some work for the old man. Nobody will have another difference. Well, I suppose not. Dear, would you feed the puppy before we sit down? His bowl's under the sink. Uh, where is he? Hey, that's funny. Here's his supper from last night, only half eaten. He's getting fussy. Hey, Blister? <laughs> hey, Blister? Blister? Where the dickens is that mutt? <laughs> maybe he's on the back porch. Oh, maybe. Here, Blister. Here, Blister. Alma. Mm -hmm. What is it, dear? Alma, look. Henry. Is he? Yes, he's dead. But, but how? What happened? Well, from the looks of it, he might have been poisoned. Poisoned? Who on earth would do a thing like that to an innocent little pup? I don't know. Let's see his dish. Oh, Henry. I don't understand this at all. Say, what's this? What's what? Well, look, there are pieces of broken glass in his food. Blue glass. Glass? Glass. Henry. Huh? Well, I, I, I just remembered something. What? 
It may just be coincidence, but in the bathroom this morning... What about the bathroom? Cindy's blue glass, you know, the one with the Mickey Mouse on it. Mm -hmm. It was broken, Henry. I found pieces in the wastebasket. I meant to ask her about it. Oh, well, Alma, for heaven's sake, you aren't suggesting that our little girl... Why, she loved Blister more than anyone. Not last night, she didn't. Why not? Well, he... he... Oh, he went after Toto. Well, who's Toto? Oh, her new doll. You bought her one of those dolls? Well, I just rented it. Rented it? Yes. I... Look, Alma. Oh, no. Oh, well, all right. Well, what's this got to do with Blister? Well, he went for the doll, and Cindy... Well, well, Cindy said... Henry, she said she'd kill him. What? Well, that's ridiculous. It's true. Good heavens, a nine-year-old child putting ground glass and dog food? She'd have to be a monster. Mommy! Now, don't say anything. I'll talk to her. Good morning, dear. Morning, Mommy. Morning. morning, Daddy. Hello. What's the matter? Uh, nothing, Cindy. Sit down, dear. Yes, sir. Cindy, uh, your mother tells me you broke your blue drinking glass. Oh, no, I didn't break it. Now, Cindy. I didn't. Well, now, somebody broke it. It wasn't your mother and it wasn't me. Well, then it must have been Toto, Cynthia. Cindy, you know Toto was only a doll. Now, a doll couldn't have broken your glass, could he? Well? But he must have done it, Daddy. Cindy, you know how Daddy feels about little girls who tell untruths. Now, did you break your glass and maybe accidentally get some pieces into Mr. Blister's dish to sort of punish him for biting your doll? Oh, no, Daddy. I'd hate to think you'd done something you knew was wrong and you were blaming it on a doll. What's the matter with Mr. Blister? Is he, is he sick? He's dead, Cindy. Oh, no, he, he can't be dead. He isn't dead, Daddy. No, he isn't. He isn't. Mommy, I... Yes, dear. But he'll come back. He has to come back. No, he won't come back, honey. Not ever. No, Cindy, not ever. <laughs> now that we've told you, Cindy, do you want to change your mind about the glass? Let me let her alone. Daddy, you think I killed Oh, see what you've done. The child feels guilty enough, Henry. Oh, dear, this is no time for feelings to interfere. Feelings don't know any time, honey. When they come, they just come. You go up to your room, honey. Daddy and I'll be up in just a minute. I don't want to. Please, Cindy. We'll be right up. Please. There, that's a good girl. And close the kitchen door behind you. Dimension X will continue in just a moment. You know, friends, breakfast of champions is a whole lot more than a phrase written across a package of Wheaties. There's one thing I could tell you. I could tell you that it means champions in the world of sports eat Wheaties. And it's so true. You bet it is. But I've got a better idea, and one I think you'll like. I think perhaps you'd rather get the story from a champion himself. So here is a champion. Will you introduce him, Ed Prentice? Now, young man, will you tell us what you do for a living? I pitch. You what? Pitch, pitch. You know, baseball. We have a baseball team, you have to have a pitcher. I'm a pitcher. I pitch. Oh, yes, yes, I see. And are you on a team? Uh, yes, sir. I'm on the Cleveland Indians. Cleveland Indians, hmm? What is your name, young man? I'm Bob Feller. And you know it as well as I do, Ed. Sure I do, Bob. It's good to see you. This makes your 14th season playing with the Indians, doesn't it? Yep, Ed. 14 years. Well, tell me, Bob, how long have you been eating Wheaties? Oh, about 20 years, give or take a couple. You mean you started eating Wheaties before you started playing ball? Why, of course. What's so strange about that? Most people start eating Wheaties before they get to playing ball. In fact, most people never start playing baseball. You don't have to be a ball player to enjoy the lift you get from Wheaties with milk and fruit. You're right as rain, Bob. No champ ever said a truer word about Wheaties. Breakfast of champions. Eat your supper, dear. I'm not hungry. Oh, Cindy, you scarcely touched your lunch. I don't feel like eating. Is it Mr. Blister? Oh, Mom. 
Cindy, answer your mother. Now, Henry, she'll work it out in her own way, dear. Oh, I don't know. When I was a boy, there was such a thing as discipline. Where this child is being brought up... Henry! Well, it's true. There's no respect. Lying. <coughs> oh, I don't know. Alma, what's happened to us? We were a nice, peaceful, happy family until you bought that cursed doll. Now who's blaming things on the doll? Well, it's true! Henry. You wanted to get some papers from your strong box. What? Oh, yes, excuse me. Will you try to eat something, Cindy? Now, darling. Yes, ma'am. Alma! Alma! Yes, Henry, what is it? Alma, it's gone. What's gone? The box, the strong box is gone. Well, it can't be. The door to your study's always locked, and you and I have the only keys. I know all that, and I tell you it isn't there. Well, who would take... I don't know, Alma. Those confidential reports, if they ever get into the wrong hands... Oh, I warned you about keeping them here. Oh, what if it ever came out in the open? Can't you see the papers? Army colonel, derelict in duty. Call the police, Henry. What, and throw my career in the wastebasket after 17 years? And we've got to find it ourselves. But it was there when I went in to clean this morning. Well, what about your key? Well, it's right here. I always keep it right with me. That's funny. Oh, no. But my other keys are all on the ring. You've lost it. I don't see how. Alma, how could you do it? Henry, please. Come on, we'll search the house. I can't think of anything else to do. Oh, dear, you're going to miss your staff meeting. Well, all right, never mind the meeting. My whole career goes up in smoke if we don't find those reports. Now, somebody get hold of your key and open that room. I know, Cindy. Oh, let the child alone. She's been through enough. You know she wouldn't do a thing like that. I don't know anything anymore. I don't know my own child. I don't even know you. All I know is that strong box is gone with papers that are dynamite if the wrong person gets them. The question being who? What's that? Coming from upstairs. What's that blasted doll again? Something must have set it off. I, I don't know how the mechanism works. Well, for heaven's sake, let's go up and shut it off. Right. Dodo, Dodo, Dodo! Kill him, kill him, kill him! How do you do? Stop how do it. How do you do? How do you do? Blasted little ah. imp! There. Henry. But since we've got this thing... Henry. We... What? Look. Where? What? Around the doll's neck. The key. The key to your study. It was Cindy after all. I don't believe it. Ever since she got this fool doll, she's been acting half insane. First the dog, now this. I think she hates us, Alma. Henry. Cindy is my child, and I know her. I know she's a good, sensitive little person with, with no malice in her. You're just simply refusing to face the facts, dear. What are you going to do? I'm going downstairs and have a talk with that young lady. Cindy, you're not telling me the truth. Oh, yes, I am, Daddy. Now, all I'm asking is that you tell me the truth. Now, where is it? I Take it, Daddy. Honest, I didn't take it. I suppose you're going to tell me now that a little six-inch doll took my strong box and hid it. Well? Cindy, I'm speaking to you. I didn't take it, Daddy. You don't understand. Toto did it. Oh, he's terrible awful. He says things. He says he's going to kill everybody. Oh, Cindy, you're inventing things. It's true. At night when I'm sleeping, he stands next to my pillow and, and whispers things to me. Awful thing. He told me he'd kill me, too, if I told him. Alma, I think this child is sick. I think she needs a doctor. It's frightened, Henry. She's trembling like a leaf. Come on, darling. We'll go up to your room. I don't want to no, go up honey, there. Mommy will stay with you. I'm afraid. He's up there. Who, Cindy? Toto. Well, he won't be up there for long. Mr. Toto is going right back to Parigi's wonderful doll shop before I lose my sanity, which means right now... <laughs> Colonel Grayson, welcome to the home of Perigi's wonderful doll. Are you Perigi? Santor Perigi, creator of the universal doll. The doll with the mind. The doll Yes, with... well, I'm returning one of your masterpieces. Oh? If you will step into the rear of my shop. Now, what is the complaint? There's no complaint. Here's your doll. Good riddance. My little Toto, rejected. You found the world of men too filled with hate. <laughs> We will change all that later on. Return to your comrades in the window, little one. And now, Colonel Grayson? I think we have no further business, sir. Ah, but we do, Colonel. Let me see. Hiya. Here it is. 
Do you recognize this, Colonel? Well, that's my strong box. Where... My little Toto is very clever, sir. Are you trying to tell me your doll stole that from me? Let us not say stole. I'm merely keeping it in custody. What's your game, Parigi? Blackmail. You give me what I want, I do not ruin your career. What do you want? Information. We already know something from the reports of the War Department concerning a certain strange-looking sphere reported by one of your pilots. What government do you represent? I represent Perigi's wonderful dolls, none other. I'm not so naive, sir. Perhaps I should explain. Each man hides something from the world. Each man loves something more than life. With the help of my wonderful dolls, I obtain personal information which enables me to control the men who control the world. Men like you. Hand over that strong box. I warn you, I have a gun. Give it to me. You are being foolish. Put down that walking stick. Now. No closer. Now. Hello. Give me the police. Hello. This is Colonel Henry Grayson. I've just killed a man. Parigi's doll shop, corner of 4th and Lexington. The body is in the rear. I'll wait for you. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> Shut up, you little fiend! Colonel Grayson! Did I hear you speak? Colonel Henry Grayson! <laughs> oh, it can't be. I must be going out of my mind. A six-inch doll... Shut up! The master's dead! You are mistaken, Colonel. I, Toto, am the master. What do you mean? If you will examine the body of Santo Parigi, you will see that he does not bleed. And he does not bleed, Colonel, because Santo Parigi never lived. Never lived? Santo Parigi is a doll. A doll? But he's a man. He talks. He walks. The people of Matrix are skilled. Meritrix? Doll builders? Who are you? I am Xanthus Imperator, commander of the legions of the third planetoid. Meritrix! Legions? Planetoid? My people and I, whom you regard as dolls, come from a tiny planet beyond the moon. What? So small that it cannot support our population. That's true. We landed one of our space spheres on Earth three months ago with the intention of colonizing. Unfortunately, one of your pilots intercepted us. So that's why you wanted our information. Precisely. And you are human? Quite human. Of course, in order to deal with Earth people without suspicion, we were forced to construct Pirigi, a man-sized doll. No, it can't be. I can't believe this. I'm, I'm having hallucinations. I've got to get out of here. That will be impossible. We have weapons of destruction quite unknown to Earth people. I phoned the police. They'll be here soon. By the time they arrive, my people will have prepared something quite shocking. <laughs> Keep me covered, Brian. Okay, Sarge. All right. You the guy who turned in the call? Yes, that's right, Sergeant. Where's the body? Well, you see, it, it isn't exactly a body. What do you mean? It, it's a doll. A what? Now, wait, you've got to let me explain. I know this sounds fantastic, but I've stumbled onto an unbelievable plot. Yeah? Keep talking. Well, you see, these little dolls, they, they aren't really dolls. They're, they're tiny people. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a big doll named Santor Parigi. They're using him as a front to run this shop. He's off his trolley, Sarge. Now, now look here. Now, I... listen, mister. We got a call that there was a murder here. Now, if there was one, where is the body? Well, it's behind the curtains. In the back. Only, you see, it isn't really a body. It's a, a big wax dummy. It's it's all part of their plot to gain control of the world. Holy smoke, he's really off his rocket. Now, look, if you don't believe me, I'll prove it to you. Come here. Look behind this curtain and you'll see the dummy lying on the floor. Welcome, gentlemen. Are you looking for something? Parigi! This is impossible. I smashed his skull. Do you know this guy? That's the one, the doll. What's your name, mister? Pirigi. Santor Pirigi, creator of the universal doll. Uh-huh. You ever see this man? Never until just now. That's not true. He's lying. I tell you, he's nothing but a big doll. The real masters of the little dolls. Ryan, are you getting this? He's wacko, Sarge. No, he's a fruitcake. I'm not crazy. I tell you, I can prove it. They must have fixed up his head where I smashed it in. Touch him and you'll see. Mr. Parigi, 
Do you know what this guy is talking about? The man is demented, obviously. No, that's not true. I tell you, there's a plot to control the Earth. I've got to call the War Department. They want to know about the flying sphere. Holy I... mackerel, this gets worse every minute. Ryan. Take him to headquarters. Now, save this... some time. Take him down to psycho ward. Okay, all right, Buck oh, Rogers. Come along nice and quiet. No, don't you see? He's nothing but a man-sized yeah, doll. Sure, I'm sure. And the little ones are going to take over the Earth, and you're but... going to wait and cut out some nice paper dolls. Oh, please, listen let's to me. Go, You've got to listen go, to me. You've got to... Sorry you had all this trouble, Mr. Parigi. Poor chap. He is obviously suffering from delusion. Well, he's not the only one in Washington today. You know, we've been getting a whole string of crack-ups lately, big wigs blowing their tops under pressure. If you could see some of the names in our confidential files... You keep confidential files on cases like this? Certainly. Believe me, they'd be dynamite if they ever got in the wrong hands. Well, I, I'd better be running the wrong <laughs> Hey, is that a talking dog? Yes, Sergeant. My name is Toto. I dance and sing. Well, I'll be... <laughs> hey, my little girl would be nuts for that. So? Then please accept the doll for saving my life. That madman might have killed me. Yes, but I... Take uh... Toto home with you as a gift. Well, now, I don't know, Mr. Parigi. It's against regulations for us to accept favors. But this I... is not for you. It is for your little daughter. And if you will only take the doll and give him a good home, you will be doing me a great favor. Well, then, if you insist, and, and thanks very much. <laughs> when my kid sees this, will she be surprised? Yes, Toto will come as a great surprise. A very great surprise. Hey, Toto? <laughs> Dimension X has transcribed Parigi's Wonderful Dolls, an original radio drama written by George Lefferts. Les Damon appeared as Colonel Grayson and Joan Alexander as Alma with Denise Alexander as Cindy. Joe DeSantis played Santor Parigi and Leon Janty was Toto, the talking doll. Engineer Bill Chambers, your narrator was Norman Rose. Music by Albert Berman. Dimension X is produced by Van Woodward and directed by Edward King. In a moment, we'll tell you about next week's show. And now, here is your Wheaties man, Frank Martin. Look at your Wheaties in a cereal bowl and, well, they look pretty innocent, don't they? They're crisp, all right, and gold and brown. And you know they've got that wonderful Wheaties nut-like taste. But where does all that energy come from? What is it about Wheaties that give you all those vitamins and minerals and protein? I'll tell you what it is. There's a whole kernel of wheat in every Wheaties flake. Not just a portion of a kernel, mind you, but a whole kernel of wheat. Now, that begins to explain things, doesn't it? Tells you why Wheaties energy helps you feel good all morning long, like I keep saying. No wonder they're America's favorite whole wheat flakes. Breakfast of champions and all that. Now you know why Wheaties at 7 can help at 11. Wheaties. Next week, the strange story of a curse that came true. It's the story of the castaways. Another adventure into the unknown world of tomorrow. The world of... Dimension X. <laughs> and this is the Wheaties man, Frank Martin, inviting you to listen Saturday, that's tomorrow night, to Joel McRae in Tales of the Texas Rangers on the Wheaties Big Parade. See you then. National Wheaties Week. Yes, it's National Wheaties Week, and Wheaties present Dimension X. On stage tonight, Dimension X, another in the Wheaties' big parade of exciting half-hour presentations. It's National Wheaties Week. Yep, time to try Wheaties. If you haven't had any for a while, try them now. If you've been eating them right along, have an extra bowl full for me. How about that? 
You know, I've been talking about Wheaties all summer, saying, see how Wheaties at 7 can help at 11. Well, by golly, they can. I get up to Wheaties, uh, bananas on mine, thanks, and I honestly feel as if I had more pep all morning. And why not you? This is National Wheaties Week. Time for you to have some Wheaties. Breakfast of champions. Oh, go ahead, have some. It's National Wheaties Week. Now, tonight's adventure into the world of the unknown. The world of Dimension X. In the South Pacific, night comes on rapidly. The sun dips below the flat horizon. The sea is crimson for a moment, and then night falls. But on Tahani Atoll, giant arc lights turn night into day. Across the waters of the lagoon within the barrier reef, launches and tugs skitter back and forth, while on the curving half-moon of the island, army trucks and jeeps scuttle down the rough roads bulldozed by the sea bees just six weeks ago. A low Quonset hut stands near the beach, surrounded by tangled wire. This is the preliminary command post, and inside is General Frank Gadosh, field director of the test. Operation Destruction. Well, everything on schedule, General Gadosh. Radiological surveys complete. Instruments placement checked. Get me Navy and tell them H hours is ordered. Send a periodic time check to Air Force and Ewan Talk and observation control on the Missouri. Yes, sir. I want a complete roster check on all personnel before H hour. That test bomb is going off at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. Even if there's a whole battalion stranded on the target vessels. You see that everybody's clear. Yes, sir. Oh, uh, Nate Cohen wants to see you. Who the devil is he? AP man. He's been selected by the press radio pool to interview you. I haven't got time. Tell him to speak to Major Breedenberg. He's the PRO. Well, I think perhaps you'd better see him, sir. The directive on public relations from Washington was very clear. How in blazes am I supposed to run a bomb test and play mother hand to a bunch of reporters? Washington, sir. All right, all right, all right. Bring him in. Really? Yes, sir. Get me some black coffee. Yes, sir. Uh, this is Mr. Cohen, uh, General Gadosh. How do you do, General? Lousy, as a matter of fact. Is that an official statement? No. And run some of that world is at the crossroads, baloney. I wrote that yesterday. General, what effect do you think the new bomb will have in the world situation? I can't tell you that, even if I knew. My job is to set the blaster thing off, see that nobody gets hurt, and collect the data. Uh, can I speak with you for a moment, sir? Later, Alan. Go ahead, Cohen. Can you release anything on the scientific principles involved? I don't even understand it myself. Wait a minute. Dr. Muller. Yes? Come over here a moment, will you? Come on, this is Dr. Fred Merler. How do you do? Civilian scientific director. He's the only one who knows what's inside that warhead. How do you do, Mr. Cohen? How about a statement, Doctor? Well, I, I'm afraid all I'm allowed to say is that the bomb is new. It's extremely powerful. And off the record, it's very tricky and dangerous. Well, what'll happen if it goes off prematurely? <laughs> I don't think we have to worry about that. In fact, we wouldn't even know about it. If you'll excuse me now. Uh, how about the natives? What about them? They're going to be evacuated from the island? They already have been. Uh, General Gadar. Well, I saw the Tahani chief outside when I came in. The whole tribe's out there squatting down at the motor pool having a conference. What? Alan. I've been trying to tell you, sir, the Tahani are still on the island. What? The LCTs are ready, aren't they? Yes, sir, but they won't go. They refuse. The scheduled call for their evacuation to Milani three hours ago. I realize that, sir, but I hoped we could still get them off without violence. Look, Alan. They're either on the island or off. Wait a minute. Cohen, that's all. What are you going to do about the natives, General? I'll issue a statement later. You're going to force them? Go on, out. I haven't got time. All right, General. Thanks. Thanks a lot. All right, Alan, let's have it. Well, sir, the Tahani have been kicking up a fuss all along. They won't leave. They won't? Do they know what's going to happen to the island? Do they know we're going to blow it higher than a kite? I told the chief, and he just said they won't go. They'll go, all right, if I have to... Get him in here. Chief... And the lieutenant who interprets. Yes, sir. How do you like that, Dr. Muller? I haven't got enough trouble. Uh, you, you know, I, I feel rather sorry for the Tahani. It can't make much sense to them. We arrive and tell them they've got to get out. I appreciate your finer feelings, Muller. But I can't let a hundred half-naked Kanakas hold up the bomb test. But they're not Kanakas, General. Captain Cook discovered the island in 1788. What's and... the difference? Lieutenant Gilbert reporting, sir. Ma uh, uh, no. I haven't got time for ceremony, Gilbert. Tell the chief he and his tribe have to get off the island. We're providing homes for the Mamalani. Uh, maruru te upa, tau tiari, iti mailani. 
Translate, Gilbert. Uh, the chief says, uh, you do not understand. Mailani is a bad island. My people have lived on Mailani from the time that our ancestors were cast away on the island. The uh, spirits of our ancestors are buried in the earth. Our fathers are buried here. Our fathers, fathers... If he thinks I'm going to move his graveyard, he's crazy. In our ancestors' time, the Tahani came in a great bird canoe. We were cast away on this island, and we have made it our home. Uh, what right have you now to carry us over the sea to a strange land where we would die weeping for our homes? We will not go. By the water of Babylon, there we sat down and we wept when we remembered Zion. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Muller. You're a great help. Gilbert. Yes, sir? Tell him I have no choice. He's got till midnight to get his tribe on board those LCTs peacefully, or I'll have the Marine Detachment carry them on board. Te mauma te watu. rather harsh, General? After all, the justice is on their side. Well, we are preparing to blow up their island, and we haven't asked them about it. Dr. Muller, you will kindly confine yourself to the scientific aspect of this operation. I'll take care of administrative matters. Well, if you could explain to them what is at stake here. Any further explaining I've got to do, I'll do with the Marine Detachment. I'm not going to hold up my schedule to coddle a hundred barefoot natives. Well, Gilbert? I told him. All right, get him out of here. I've heard enough. What the devil is that? It's some kind of a curse, sir. I, I can catch some of it. The island will remember the tears of its children and punish the invaders. The great destroyer will not destroy, and the evil man who is the chief will travel far through the blackness of night, even as the children of the island end, so will he. All right, Gilbert, take him away. Yes, sir. Well, not yet, Kai Kai Boy. Ben Lallan, get a detail from the Marine Detachment with tear gas and small arms down to the motor pool. One hour, have those natives on that transport, and I don't care how they do it. Is that my coffee, Varelli? Yes, sir. They must know about the bomb. The great destroyer will not destroy. You worried about that curse? Well, I, I should think you might be. He threatened you personally. If I were you, I'd carry a pistol till they got off the island. The chief looked as if he'd cheerfully strangled you with his bare hands. I'm supposed to end the way they do, huh? What's that? Oh, probably the Tahani saying goodbye to their island. I think I'll go down to the motor pool. Well, stay out of the way and get back here in an hour. Well. We've got to have this wrapped up and headquarters moved out to the Missouri by dawn. Navy and instrument room checking in, sir. That's the last. Have the Missouri take over control in Central, my chief. Yes, sir. Are the LCTs uh, standing by with those natives? Yes, sir. They're on the beach. Uh, the bomb unit is assembled in place, General. 2330, right on the nose. Robin, start evacuation procedure. The Tahani have stopped. Allen's probably moving them out to the beach. Check in with Navy and Air Force rally. Yes, sir. What's that? Well, it's, it's coming from the beach. Tahani making trouble. Come on. You, you, Gilbert, what is it? Yes, sir. Colonel Allen ordered the Marines in, sir. What happened? What happened, man? The natives. They, they just got up and started marching. Did they embark? Oh, you don't understand, sir. They marched up the cliff and right off into the lagoon. What? All of them. The women and the kids, too. They, they didn't even try to swim, sir. What were you doing all this time? Just standing around with your thumb in your mouth? Where was the Marine detachment? We couldn't stop them, sir. They just walked over the cliff. They didn't even scream, not even the kids. We, we sent the crash boats out, but we couldn't get any of them out. Crazy idiots. Were any of the reporters there? Uh, Cohen and a life photographer. Get his film and hold it till I release it. Uh, what are you going to do, General? Postpone HR? It's too late for that now. And calling HR off isn't going to bring the natives back. But 100 men, women, and children just walking into the water, it's horrible. Look, I'm not happy about it either, but there's nothing we can do now. I gave them a chance to get off. They didn't want to take it. That's their hard luck, not mine. I hope you're right. What do you mean by that? Oh, I was just thinking about the curse the chief put on you. Even as the children of the island end, so will he. That's what he said to you, General. I heard him. Keep waiting, General. The great destroyer will not destroy. That must mean the bomb. Don't worry, Dr. Muller. It'll take more than a mumbo-jumbo curse from a native witch doctor to stop this operation. At each hour, that bomb goes off. Now, 
H hour minus one minute, 30 seconds. H minus 130. Video screens hooked in, sir. All right, check control stations. Observation station one. Observation station one, check. Radiation station. Radiation control, check. Testifying Observation second, station Miller. station right, two. General. Observation station two, check. Damage control All station. Set. Damage control, check. Communications. Communications, check. All checked in. It's H minus one minute, H minus one. Take a good look at that island on the screen, Muller. When you throw that key, it just won't be there anymore. Nothing but an atom mushroom over the lagoon. It's quite a funeral pyre for the Tahani. Stubborn idiots. The way it serves them right, Muller. It can't get in the way of progress. Progress? I wonder if it is, General. It's H minus 30 seconds. H hour minus 30. 29, 28, 27, 26, The Great Destroyer. That's what he called the bomb. Hold it, Miller. Holland report. All checked in. Camera's running. Sound fire warning. Stand by for firing. Ready, Miller? Ready. 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, fire! General, it, it didn't go off. Rally. The bomb didn't go off. Rally, signal stand by, condition red. I'll uncheck readings. Muller, what's wrong? What happened? I, I don't know. The bomb didn't go off. What do you mean? Why did it go off? I don't know, except for one thing. The Tahani chief said the great destroyer would not destroy. It didn't, General. The bomb didn't go off. Dimension X will continue in just a moment. It's National Wheaties Week. And from behind the scene in the radio studio, here comes one of Hollywood's foremost radio producers, Mr. Joe Parker, stepping out of the control room to help celebrate National Wheaties Week. Mr. Parker puts on radio program, and he's a visitor to Dimension X tonight. His regular program for Wheaties is Sarah's Private Keeper. Joe's a regular guy. He sits there in the glass cage called the control room, running his show. But right now, here he is at the microphone to say his say about Wheaties. Ready, Joe? Thanks, Frank. You know, folks, I sit there in the glass cage, as Frank calls it, and I have to stop my programs long enough for him to talk about Wheaties. But you know, I don't mind. I kind of like this talk about Wheaties and milk and fruit. That's a lot of good eating. And I like the idea of celebrating National Wheaties Week, too. You know, we enjoy putting radio programs on for your entertainment, and we'd enjoy knowing that, well, that you're going to try Wheaties because of us. I hope you'll get Wheaties tomorrow and have some. The whole family. Matter of fact, I think I'll join you. Thank you, producer Joe Parker. If you like this program, friends, get some Wheaties and help celebrate National Wheaties Week. statement? Nothing you can use, Cone. Not until we find out what went wrong. Why don't you come aboard this ship? Yeah, I walked on. You don't know why the bomb failed. Huh? It didn't fail. Just didn't go off. Say, what's that tank thing on deck, General? Undersea salvage unit Mark IV. They call it an undersea crawler. Well, somebody going down? That bomb is down there in the lagoon somewhere. Could go off at any second. Somebody has to go down, find it, and disarm it. Yeah, that's a lovely job. Who's elected? I am. I'm Dr. Muller. He's the only one who knows how to dismantle it. The crawler's ready, General. All right, come on, Muller. I'm ready. Well, as soon as we hit shallow water, get those gates open. We'll pull the crawler out, then you get away in a hurry. That bomb goes off while we're working on it. I don't want any casualties. Yes, sir. Inside, Muller. All right. I'm in. I'm in. Remember, get this LCT out of the lagoon in a hurry. You got that, Alan? You take your orders from Admiral Yancey. Yes, sir. And, uh, good luck. 
Closing the hatch. Get the sonar and Geiger counter warmed up, Muller. Right. I uh, was just thinking of something, General. Uh, that curse, part of it came true. The bomb didn't go off. Well? Uh, the uh, second part of that curse was that you would end where they ended, and that was at the bottom of the lagoon. What are you trying to do, Muller? Uh, nothing. I, I was just thinking this crawler is going to take us right down there where the Tahani died. I'm not worried about a handful of dead natives, Muller. I'm worried about that bomb. Okay, they're opening the gate. Let's go. SU-4 to control. Depth 50 feet, bottom sandy. Dropping off sharp. Anything on sonar, Muller? A school of fish. Never been down the crawler before? <laughs> Only in the tank at New London. I think I've got a Geiger reading dead ahead. Hang on. We're going up over the reef. It must be the bomb, all right. The uh, Geiger count is clocking like a prude hen. Keep an eye on the front vision plate. They run over the bomb, we're liable to set it off. I think I'm getting something on sonar. Left a point. USU for the control. Over. USU for the control. Over. That's a fine note. Radio's out. Dead ahead. It, um, it looks too large to be the bomb. Can't see much in the forward vision, plate. Wait a minute. That's part of the reef ahead. Well, that's where the Geiger reading indicated. The, uh, the bomb must have settled in a hole in the reef. You have to go after it in diving suits. Suits are in the locker. Let's get this over with. The less time I spend down here waiting for that bomb to blow, the better I like it. Grab your helmet. You getting me all right on your headset? Okay, I'm gonna fill the lock. There goes the outer door. Let's go. This isn't like that diving tank in New London. Look out for that car. Cut you to ribbons. There's a... There's an opening of some sort there. Where'll I get the light up? See if we can get a Geiger reading out of that opening. Uh, just a... Over there. It's down there, all right. Careful. I'll drop down first. You see anything down there? Well, uh, get down here fast. What is it? You find something? The bottom of this hole. It's metal on the sides. But, but it's the coral reef. Look. Well, the joints. There's a hull plate of some kind, and... Look out above us! It's closing! Grab it! It's too late. A little hatch. Just lit over the top. This is impossible. What's going on? It's like an airlock. Water's being pumped out. General, do you realize what this means? I'm not sure. There's an inner door opening. Careful. It's a passageway. What do we do now? There isn't much to do. We can take off our helmets, so. Now shows good air. Yeah. All right. Come on. What is this? Undersea fort? What's it doing here? What does it mean? Whatever it is. A bomb must be down here. Wait. There's someone there. Well, I, I can't see. There's a shadow. Who is it? Who's that? Ma'anua, Dr. Mother. Welcome to our ship. We have been waiting for you. General. 
It can't be. Do you see it? It's the Tani Chief. How long has the undersea crawler been down, Varelli? Four hours, sir. Two since we lost contact. Well, keep trying. Yes, sir. Uh, I've given them enough time. I'm going to send another crawler down. What do you figure happened to them, Colonel? Well, there are a lot of things. Hey, uh, how did you get in here? I walked in. So when are you going to release this, Colonel? It's the biggest story since the election. The bomb at Dud, Dr. Muller, General Gadosh dead. They're not dead. At least we don't know they are. As long as the bomb doesn't go off, there's still a chance that something could... What happened? The bomb. Morelli. Condition red. Gilbert, radiation control into action. Yes, sir. Get the hot squad into Tehani Lagoon as soon as it's clear. And get me a PT board with radiation screens. What is it, Colonel? What happened? The bomb must have blown. What about Muller, the general? If they were down in that lagoon, you guess. Five and steady. Well, take her in as close to the beach as you can. Steady as she goes. Is there any danger of more explosions? No, when she goes, she goes. Radiation 82. The danger is radioactivity. Our shields aren't much good, but we've got to pick up the recording instruments as soon after the blast as possible. Radiation 93.5. Well, that's still safe. Hey, Cohen, uh, is that something on the beach there? Oh, yeah, it looks like a body. Maybe you blew one of the Tahani back out of the lagoon. No, 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 it's, it's, it's moving. Gilbert, glasses. Yes, sir. It's a man, all right. Head into the beach. Aye, aye, sir. Who is it, Colonel? I can't tell, but he's in a diving suit. It's either Muller or General Gadosh. <laughs> No radiation burns, superficial bruises, mild shock. He'll be all right, Colonel. Can he talk? For a while. I'm going to give him a sedative shortly. Mm. Muller, Muller, uh, what happened? How did the bomb go off? Oh, you oh, didn't. He's still out of his head. Quiet, Colonel, quiet. Go on, Dr. Muller. Uh, what did you find? A ship. A giant metal ship there under the lagoon. A submarine? No, no, no. It was... It was a spaceship camouflaged right next to the reef. What? When we went inside, we found the Tahani chief and all the tribe alive. What are you saying? Well, they drowned in the lagoon. I saw them. No, they didn't commit suicide as we thought. They just dived underwater into the rocket. A rocket? Built by Polynesian savages? But they're not savages. They're... They're castaways. They're from another planet. Don't you understand? Their spaceship was wrecked here 400 years ago. They've been waiting... Ever since for a chance to go home. Uh, this boy's out of his mind. You better put him under the sedative, Doctor. It's true. They'd exhausted their fuel. They couldn't find anything here on Earth to replace it. Until we developed atomic power. Atomic power? You mean they stole our bomb? They made me dismantle it for them at the point of a gun. And then just before they blasted off, they let me go. But uh, what about the General? Uh, you mean they killed him? You don't understand. I said I dismantled that bomb at the point of a gun. It was General Gadosh who was holding it. What's that? Yes, yes, he was one of them, one of their spies, sent out to bring back the rocket fuel they needed. And now, after 400 years... The castaways are, are going home.
Jackson X has transcribed The Castaways, written by Ernest Canoy from an original story by Ernest Canoy and George Lefferts. Featured in the cast were Santos Ortega as General Gadosh, Greg Morton as Dr. Muller, your narrator Norman Rose, music by Albert Berman, engineer Bill Chambers. Dimension X is produced by Van Woodward and directed tonight by Jack Cuny. In a moment, we'll tell you about next week's show. And now, here is your Wheaties man, Frank Martin. It's National Wheaties Week, and listen. If producer Joe Parker is going to buy Wheaties tomorrow, and I go out and buy Wheaties tomorrow, and you go out and buy Wheaties tomorrow, well, that makes three of us, huh? And if everybody goes out and buys Wheaties tomorrow, then the whole doggone country is going to be celebrating National Wheaties Week in the proper manner. And it's a real nice celebration, too. Pour out those golden flakes, pour on the milk, put on the fruit, and you'll be eating good to be feeling good. Breakfast of champions. Get yours. It's National Wheaties Week. Next week on Dimension X, a dramatization of Ray Bradbury's new novel, The Martian Chronicles, the epic story of how man conquered a new planet and then lost his own. Another adventure into the unknown world of the future, the world of... Dimension X. And this is the Wheaties man, Frank Martin, inviting you to listen also on Saturday, that's tomorrow night, to Joel McRae in Tales of the Texas Rangers on the Wheaties Big Parade. It's National Wheaties Week. Swing your partners right and left. It's National Wheaties Week. Come on, everybody, to the Wheaties party. Eat a lot of Wheaties like the champions do. Dance together cheek to cheek. This is National Wheaties Week. Eat a lot of Wheaties like the champions do. Wheaties are breakfast of champions. Jack Late tells the story of the Canada Kid, next on NBC. Exciting news for adventure seekers. Join us on a thrilling journey through the vibrant landscapes and diverse culture of Brazil. Lost in Brazil brings you to captivating videos showcasing the heart-pounding adventures, mouth-watering cuisine, hidden gems of this incredible country. From bustling cities to tranquil beaches, our videos capture the essence of Brazil's beauty, experience the warmth of its people, the rhythm of its music, and the thrill of exploration. Click on the link in the description to find out more. By transcription. It's National Wheaties Week. <laughs> Yes, it's National Wheaties Week, and Wheaties present Dimension X. On stage tonight, Dimension X, another in the Wheaties big parade of exciting half-hour presentations. It's National Wheaties Week, the week to buy Wheaties and eat Wheaties and enjoy them as never before. The time to really find out what difference a good breakfast with Wheaties can make. You know, you're getting protein when you dip into a bowl full of Wheaties. You're getting whole wheat minerals and vitamins. You're getting whole wheat energy. Yup, there's a whole kernel of wheat in every Wheaties flake. That's how a better breakfast, beginning with Wheaties, can help you step lively all morning long. And that's why all over this big country, folks are celebrating National Wheaties Week and stepping lively. So how about it? Get out the big cereal bowl and help celebrate Breakfast of Champions. Pour out those golden flakes, put on the milk, put on the fruit, and let's have National Wheaties Week. You ready? Let's go. Tonight, Dimension X presents The Martian Chronicles, a dramatization of the new novel by one of our most brilliant young science fiction writers, Ray Bradbury. 
The Martian Chronicles. January in the year 1999. One minute it was Ohio winter with doors closed, the panes blind with frost, icicles fringing every roof, children skiing on snowy slopes. And then a long wave of warmth crossed the small town, a flooding sea of hot air. Bye, Mom, I'm going out. William McClellan, you come back here. You know you can't go out in winter without a cold. You want to catch your death of cold? But it isn't cold, it's warm outside. It's rocket summer. Rocket summer? You know, like Indian summer. The rocket lay on the launching field, blowing out pink clouds of fire and heat, cracking the icicles, melting the snow, making summer with every breath of its mighty exhausts. It seared the faces of the watching crowd and drove them back. And then they saw the red fire and heard the big sound as the silver rocket shot up toward Mars and left them behind on an ordinary Monday morning on the ordinary planet, Earth. They lived in a house of crystal pillars on the planet Mars by the edge of an empty sea. And every morning you could see Ila eating the golden fruits that grew from the crystal walls, or her husband sitting alone in his room reading from a singing metal book over which he brushed his hand as one might play a harp. Ila and her husband were not old. Once they had liked painting pictures with chemical fire, swimming in the canals when the wine trees filled them with green liquors and talking into the dawn together. But no more. Marriage sometimes makes people old and familiar while still young. And Ela was not happy now. This morning she sat dreaming between the crystal pillars and wished that somehow a miracle might happen. And then suddenly... Oh. Ela, did you call? No. I thought I heard you cry out. Did I? I was almost asleep and had a dream. In the daytime? Hmm. You don't often do that. Strange. A very strange. I dreamed about a man. A tall man. Six feet tall. Oh, how absurd. He'd be a giant, a misshapen giant. I know. And yet, somehow, he looked quite handsome. He was dressed in a strange uniform. And he came down out of the sky in a long silver craft. Out of the sky? <laughs> what nonsense. He spoke pleasantly to me in another language. But somehow, I understood him with my mind. Telepathy, I suppose. A really ill. And he said, I've come from the third planet in my ship. My name is Nathaniel York. A stupid name. Who ever heard of a name like that? Perhaps they have names like that on Earth. That's ridiculous, Hila. Everyone knows the third planet is incapable of supporting life. There's too much oxygen in their atmosphere. I suppose. But haven't you ever wondered if... Well, wouldn't it be fascinating if there were people there... And they traveled through space in some sort of ship? Oh, really, Ella? You know, I hate this emotional wailing. Well, let's get on with our work. Evening came. The twin white moons of Mars were rising. And the house closed itself in like a giant flower. A wind blew among the pillars, stirring Ella's russet hair, crooning softly in her ear. And it was then that she began singing the song. Drink to me only thine eyes And I will pledge with mine Yela, what's that song? I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? I've never heard it before. Did you compose it? No. Yes. No, I don't know, really. I don't even know what the words are. They're in another language. It was part of the dream I had, I guess. Oh. You know, you haven't been yourself lately. It might do you good if we went away to the Blue Mountains for a week or so. Uh, what? Did you hear what I said? I'm sorry. I was watching the sky. You're certainly interested in the sky tonight. It's very beautiful. Well, what about my suggestion? 
Shall we leave for the Blue Mountains in the morning? You mean go away now? Oh, no. No? Why not? Why don't you want to go? I don't know. I just don't want to, that's all. Oh, leave a kid in the cup and not ask who... Ela, I'm sick of that silly song. It's late. Let us sleep. From the crystal walls poured a soft carpeting of mist to support Ela where she lay down to sleep. But through the night she tossed restlessly until just at dawn the dream recurred. Ela, oh. Ela, wake up. What? Oh, what is it? You've been dreaming again. You talked in your sleep. Did I? Yes. What were you dreaming? Oh, the ship. It came from the sky again. And the tall man stepped out and talked with me. <laughs> Telling me little jokes and laughing. What else happened? And then this, this Captain York... Oh, I can't. It's all so silly. Tell me! He said I was beautiful. And then he kissed me. I thought so. What else? Why, Eel, you're so bad-tempered. It's only a dream. Is it? You know I can read your mind. You can't keep secrets from me. Well, all that happened was this Captain York told me... Well, he told me he'd take me away in his ship into the sky. Take me back to his planet with him. <laughs> it's quite ridiculous, really. Ridiculous, is it? You should have heard yourself. Fawning on him, talking to him, singing with him all night. In your dream, he landed in Green Valley, didn't he? Please. And he told you he was coming today. Yes. But what's come over you? It was only a dream. You can't be jealous of that. No, no, I suppose not. Forgive me. I'm being childish. Ian, you're sick. You've been working too hard. No, no, I'm all right. But perhaps you're right. Maybe I could use a little relaxation. Yes. I think I'll take the morning off and go hunting. Hunting? Yes, in Green Valley. Numbly, she watched him go to a closet and draw forth an evil-looking weapon. And then her husband was gone walking toward Green Valley. And Ela waited, watching the sky for an unknown thing, trembling with a nameless fear. And then it happened. A whirring, rushing sound. The warmth as of a giant fire passing in the air. The gleam of metal in the sky. He's come, it's true. The dream is true. The rocket vanished over the hill. The sky was empty again. And trembling, Ela waited again, looking toward Green Valley and seeing nothing, listening for sounds and hearing nothing, until... A shot sounded, very sharply, the sound of the evil weapon. Oh, no. No, no, no. Her body jerked with the sound, and she wanted to scream and never stop screaming. For now, she knew the dream could never come true. And there was nothing left but the song, the strange and fine and beautiful song. Drink to me only with thine eyes, and I will pledge with mine, or leave a kiss within the cup. <laughs> But still the rockets came. The next ship came down from the stars and the black velocities and the silent gulfs of space and landed by night near a Martian city. The men made their way to the outer rim of the dreaming city and then Jeff Spender went in to reconnoiter while the others watched and waited. Waited for something to stir in the haunted city, some gray form to rise, some voice to break the unearthly stillness. Where were the people? Where were the Martians? Nothing stirred to disturb the silence until... Halt! Who goes there? Don't shoot! Hold it, Parker. Let's spend her in his party. They're coming back. 
Captain Wilder, over here. Well? Captain, we've searched the city. People were living here last week. People? Martians. Where are they now? Dead. Dead? What did they die of? You won't believe it, Captain. Chicken pox. Good Lord, no. Yes. No resistance to an Earth disease, I guess. So the other rocket did get through to Mars. It looks like it, Captain. God only knows what the Martians did to them. But at least we know what they did to the Martians. You mean they're all dead? Yes. This planet is through. Hey, you hear that, guys? We're safe. <laughs> Break out a bottle, Cookie. Let's have a drink to celebrate. Stop it, Parkhill. Put down that bottle. Ah, uh, what's eating you, Spender? The planet's ours now. We got a christener, don't we? <laughs> I christen thee the city of... Uh, I christen... Hey, Park Hill City, huh? Park Hill, I warned you! <laughs> All right, Spender, that's enough. That'll cost you a $50 fine. Crookie McClure, take care of Park Hill. Spender, you come with me. All right, Spender, why did you hit him? I don't know, Captain. I was ashamed, I guess. Ashamed of Sam Parkhill and the noise and the spectacle the whole crew is making. It's been a long trip. It's only natural they'd want to have their fling. Yes, but where's their sense of what's right? Their respect for what's happened here? Captain, a race builds itself for a million years, refines itself, builds cities like this one, does everything it can to give itself respect and beauty and... And then, it dies. Of what? Not anything fine or majestic or fitting, but, but a dirty little thing like chicken pox. And Sam Parkhill wants to celebrate. I know, Spender, but you've got to remember, you've a different way of seeing things. I'm seeing things all right. I'm seeing what we'll do to Mars. We'll rip it up, rip the skin off, ruin it the way we've ruined our own planet. Captain... Look at the city. It may be the last time you'll ever see it this way. Beautiful in the moonlight, isn't it? Yes. There's a poem by Byron that describes it and how the Martians would feel tonight if there were any, any of them left to feel. So we'll go no more a-roving so late into the night. Though the heart be still as loving and the moon be still as bright. For the sword outwears its sheath and the soul wears out the breast. And the heart must pause to breathe and love itself must rest. Though the night was made for loving and the day returns too soon. Yet we'll go no more a-roving by the light of the moon. Without a word, the Earthmen stood and looked at the city. The bottle lay shattered at Sam Parkhill's feet, and the sour stench of liquor filled the cool air. The men of Earth had come to Mars. <laughs> Dimension X will continue in just a moment. It's National Wheaties Week. Yes, the week when everybody tries Wheaties, even an orchestra leader. And here he comes from behind the scenes in radio to help celebrate National Wheaties Week, Mr. Von Dexter. Thank you, Frank. Hello, folks. I understand this is National Wheaties Week. I can't get a kick out of that. The only breakfast food in the world with a week of its own. And I'm here for just one thing, to ask you to try Wheaties during National Wheaties Week. There are a lot of us whose voices you've never heard on the Wheaties' big parade of radio programs, you know, backstage people. Like musicians. Right, Frank, like musicians. We'd get great pleasure from knowing you like these programs well enough to buy a box of Wheaties tomorrow. Wheaties are good. They're nice to eat. I like them. I think you will. Try them once during National Wheaties Week. Will you do that? Vaughn, I think the folks will. Good. Thank you. Good night. The men of Earth came to Mars. They came because they were afraid or unafraid. 
because they were happy or unhappy, because they felt like pilgrims or did not feel like pilgrims. The government posters screamed, there's work for you in the sky, see more! And the men shuffled forward, all kinds of men, all coming for different reasons. The rockets came like drums beating in the night. They came like locusts, swarming and settling in blooms of rosy smoke. Mars was a distant shore, and the settlers spread upon it in waves. First the pioneers and builders, then the people of civilization. Some came because they were afraid of a coming war on Earth. Some came because they were afraid of nothing. Some came to escape from the smell of the subways and the cabbage tenements. And some came from houses like the one in Ohio. It was a good house, the house in Ohio, and for six years the family had lived there contentedly, enjoying music and poetry and the rich, warm things of life. For the house had been built to be lived in in the year 2020. It contained all the latest automatic devices, from talking book recorders to singing clocks. As the family rose and dressed, the beds whirred electronically and made themselves. In the kitchen, the stove sighed and ejected from its warm interior eight eggs, sunny side up, 12 bacon slices, two coffees, and two glasses of milk. Seven, nine, breakfast time. Come and dine. Seven, nine. Beside the breakfast table, the facsimile machine clacked and deposited the morning paper on the table. The headlines today spoke ominously of the danger of a coming war. And the man frowned as he read the news. Today is August 4th, 2026. Insurance, gas, and at and heat bills are due. And today, remember, the family has planned a picnic. Gee, Dad, are we really going? Sure, Timmy, why not? It's raining out. It's not raining where we're going, son. Now run upstairs, pack your fishing tackle. We're going on our picnic, all right. Okay, Dad. Bill... Are you sure we ought to go? Yes. Have you seen the headlines this morning? Looks bad, doesn't it? Mm Mm-hmm. The rocket's ready. All we have to do is pack and take off. I know, but... Well, flying to Mars, it seems so crazy. Well, all right, then we'll go. Should we tell the children why we're going? No, not yet. Let them enjoy the picnic. The house went on with its appointed tasks. 9.15, time to clean. 9.15, time to clean. Out of the molding darted hundreds of tiny mechanical mice, all rubber and metal. They sucked up the dust and dirt in the house and popped back into their burrows. In the walls, relays clicked. Memory tapes glided under electric eyes. Recorded voices moved under steel needles. 12 o'clock, 2 o'clock, 4 o'clock, 6 o'clock, tick-tock. Evening came. In the living room, the hearth fire bloomed out of nothing, and the phonograph spoke from beside the fireplace. Mrs. McClellan, what poem would you like to hear this evening? Mr. McClellan, since you express no preference, I shall select at random from among your favorites. Sarah Teasdale, There Will Come Soft Rains. There will come soft rains and the smell of the ground and swallows circling with their shimmering sound and frogs in the pool singing at night and wild plum trees in tremulous white. Robins will wear their feathery fire whistling their whims on a low fence wire and not one will know of war. Not one will care at last when it is done. Not one would mind, neither bird nor tree, if mankind perished utterly. And spring herself when she woke at dawn but scarcely know that we were gone. The phonograph finished the poem, but there was no one there to hear, for the family had gone to Mars. <laughs> Ah! 
On the Martian desert beside the highway, there rose a blare of red and yellow neon lights that spelled the death of Jeff Spender's dream. Sam's hot dog stand is what the sign read. And Sam, of course, was the same Sam Parkhill who had fought with Spender years before. 10,000 rockets were reported leaving soon for Mars with 100,000 hungry customers. And Sam wanted to be ready for them. Hey, look up there, Elmer. Hmm? See that green star up there? That's Earth. Ah, good old wonderful earth. <laughs> Makes you feel almost reverent, don't it? Yeah. Send me you're hungry and you're starved. Uh, something, something. That's a poem I learned in school. <laughs> Come on, Earth, send me your rockets. Here's Sam Parker with the only hot dog stand on Mars. Sam, what if the rockets don't come? What if there's a war on Earth? Ah, don't worry, they're coming all right. Ain't nothing gonna happen to spoil my plans, baby. I figured it all out. Sam! Hey, Sam, look up there! Earth! Oh, what? Oh, no. It's catching fire. It's burning. No, oh, no, that can't be Earth. Helma, they can't do this to me. I got all our money invested <laughs> in this place. I... Go ahead, Sam. Switch on more lights. Turn up the music. Get the hot dogs on the fire. There'll be another batch of customers coming along in about a hundred million years. Oh, no, it couldn't be. What a swell spot for a hot dog stand. Let you in on a little secret, Sam. This looks like it's going to be an off season. The light beam radio crackled with the news. War! By morning, the shelves of the luggage store were empty, and the rockets were blasting off, headed back to Earth. In a few days, everyone was gone, and the planet of Mars once more lay deserted and silent. And then, after all the rest had gone... One last rocket landed on Mars. A small, family-sized rocket come all the way from Earth. It seemed a long way to go for a picnic, but Dad had suggested a fishing trip, and Mother thought the whole family would enjoy a vacation. So here they were, floating down a Martian canal, with Timothy sitting in the back of the boat with Dad and Mother up front holding Alice the baby, and the deserted Martian towns drifting slowly by. What is it, Timmy? When do we see the Martians? You promised we would. Soon, Tim, soon. Oh, but William, the last Martians died out years ago. They're a dead race now. Not quite. Don't worry, son. I'll show you some real live Martians later on. Gee, this is swell. I wish we didn't ever have to go home. How long can we stay? A million years. A million years? Yes. It's time we told you, son, we're not going home. This is where we'll live from now on. But what about the rocket? What about Ohio? There's nothing there now but ruins. The last Earth radio just went off the air. That means the war is over and Earth is finished. We're going to blow up our rocket and start all over. See if we can't build a better world up here. You mean Mars is going to be our home? Yes. I hope you don't mind too much. No, sir. But what about the Martians? When do we get to see them? There they are, son. Look down at the water. I don't see anything there. Beside the boat. Look at the reflections in the water. But, but that's us down there. Just you and me and Mom and the baby. Yes, son. You see, we're the Martians now. For a long, silent moment, Timmy stared down at the reflections of the family in the waters. And the Martians stared back up at him. Then he lifted his eyes to the deep ocean sky, trying once more to see Earth and the house he had always called home. But Earth was too far away, and the house was now only a heap of radioactive rubble. Only one wall remained standing, and within the wall a voice spoke again and again and again. Not one would mind, neither bird nor tree, if mankind perished utterly. And spring herself, when she woke at dawn, would scarcely know that we were gone, 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 that we were gone. 
2026. Today is October 5th, 2026. You have just heard The Martian Chronicles, a dramatization of highlights from the new novel by Ray Bradbury. Your narrator was Norman Rose, and featured in the cast were Inga Adams, Roger DeCoven, and Donald Buca. Music by Albert Berman, engineer Bill Chambers. Dimension X is produced by Van Woodward and directed by Jack Cuny. In a moment, we'll tell you about next week's show. And now, here is your Wheaties man, Frank Martin. Go out and get the Wheaties. It's National Wheaties Week. Yep, this is the week everybody's trying Wheaties. See yourself how Wheaties at 7 can help at 11. A better breakfast beginning with Wheaties can help make a wonderful difference because there's a whole kernel of wheat in every Wheaties flake. So eat happy, work happy. Wheaties, breakfast of champions. Get yours. Get yours. It's National Wheaties Week. Next week, the strange and chilling story of The Parade. The parade that suddenly turned into a funeral procession for the world of tomorrow. The world of... Dimension X. And this is the Wheaties man, Frank Martin, inviting you to listen on Saturday, that's tomorrow night, to Joel McRae in Tales of the Texas Rangers on the Wheaties Big Parade. See you then. Remember, it's National Wheaties Week. Swing your partners right and left. It's National Wheaties Week. Come on, everybody, to the Wheaties party. Eat a lot of Wheaties like the champions do. Dance together cheek to cheek. This is National Wheaties Week. Eat a lot of Wheaties like the champions do. Wheaties a breakfast of champions. The preceding was transcribed. Coming up is Jack Late. Listen for Bill Bendix, October 6th on NBC. It's National Wheaties Week. It's National Wheaties Week, and Wheaties presents Dimension X. Transcribed on stage tonight, Dimension X, another in the Wheaties big parade of exciting half-hour presentations. It's National Wheaties Week, and here's the forecast for tomorrow morning. Bright and cheerful with occasional smiles, followed by a good morning all morning long. (laughs) <laughs> you think I'm kidding? No, sir, you can have a better morning around your house tomorrow if you start it off with a good breakfast, including, I hope, a bowl of Wheaties with milk and fruit. Nourishment? Say, Wheaties have it to give. To you, right here in National Wheaties Week, there's a whole kernel of wheat in every Wheaties flake. Talk about vitamins and minerals and protein. They're yours in Wheaties. All you have to do is get them, those Wheaties, at your nearest store. Get them and try them once this week. For me. For you. Try them once and see for yourself how Wheaties at 7 can help at 11. Ready? Let's go. It's National Wheaties Week. Now, tonight's adventure into the unknown world of the future. The world of Dimension X, where anything can happen. You are Mr. Sid Ryan? The same. My name is Lucia. I'm a Martian. Pleased to meet you, Mr. Lu... What was that again? A Martian. A Martian, huh? As in Orson Welles? Precisely. I'm a Rotarian myself. (laughs) Sit down. (laughs) Thank you. (sighs) And uh, now that we've had our little joke, Mr. Lucia, what can Publicity Associates do for you? It has been my observation 
that advertising and publicity are the very backbone of earthly civilization. Spoken like a true Martian, Mr. Lujan. Now, if you'll tell me the name of the client. The client, of course, will be the Martian. <laughs> you don't give up, do you? Give up? The gag, I mean. Oliver. Oh, yes, Mr. Ryan? This is Mr. Lusha. How do you Mr. Do, Mr. Lusha Lush? claims to be a Martian. Take him outside, will you, Oliver? Get the name of the sanatorium he escaped from and tell them to bring the butterfly net. Wait, sir. I'm happy to see, Mr. Ryan, that my telling you I am a Martian has approximately the effect I supposed it would have. I believe we can do business. I have here a cash retainer of $5,000. Five thousand. <laughs> Sit down, Mr. Lucia. Hey, uh, Oliver, get the client a cigar. Yes, sir. Uh, no, 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 the other box, the other no, box. Thank you, no. Uh, well, now, uh, what can I do for you, sir? I wish you to manage a publicity campaign, a very large, a very important campaign. Is the product established, or is it something brand new? Oh, something quite new. Now, what would you judge to be the most effective type of campaign. Well, if the client has a lot of dough to throw around, a suspense campaign is best. First, you place ads in the paper saying, watch this space. Mm. Then, about a week later, you run an ad saying XYZ or PDQ, and you get people guessing what it means. Mm. Then, finally, when you've teased them enough, you bust loose and unveil the product. <laughs> Excellent. Very well, sir. We shall conduct a suspense campaign. Of course, in this kind of campaign, secrecy is very important. Once the name of the product leaks out, it spreads like wildfire, and the whole campaign is kerfloppo. Kerfloppo. <clears throat> yes, quite so, quite so. Utmost secrecy. That's right. Uh, you uh, realize, of course, these things cost like crazy. Would say one million dollars cover the expense? Uh, come again? I said would one million dollars cover it. <laughs> Why, yes, I imagine... Uh, you did say one million dollars. I understood that you had handled some very large accounts. Of course, if this is too big... Oh, not at all, not at all. As a matter of fact, I seldom touch anything less. Uh, right, Oliver? Huh? Oh, 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 of course. That's right, Mr. Ryan. Absolutely right. Good. You will begin, then, by saturating the newspapers, the radio, streetcars, with a very simple statement. What's that? I shall write it for you. The... Martians are coming. <laughs> Say, that's not a bad teaser. Got that, Oliver? Yes, sir. The next ad will read, June 1st is Martian Day. June 1st is Martian Day. What happens on June 1st? The parade takes place. What parade? I wish you to arrange a parade up Fifth Avenue. You mean like the uh, Macy Parade? Exactly. Except that the theme will be the world of tomorrow. The Martian world. Uh, my client would like it to be a, a gay affair. Balloons, clowns, pennants, pretty drum majorettes. Say, that sounds terrific. I might be able to interest the department stores in a tie-in. Fine. The uh, parade will climax the campaign. On June 1st, the product will be unveiled. Good enough. Uh, by the way, Mr. Lucia, just what is the product? Uh, what are we selling? <laughs> oh, no, Mr. Ryan. Secrecy, remember. Oh, but after all... All will be revealed to you in good time, Mr. Ryan. For the moment, let us say, we are selling a concept. A uh, concept? Precisely. The concept of invasion from Mars. <laughs> Uh, Benny Marcus, please. This is Benny. Uh, Benny, this is Sid Ryan over at Publicity Associates. Listen, Benny, how are you fixed for midgets? I got midgets. Fine. I need 40 midgets for a parade. 40. June 1st. And listen, Benny, I want them dressed in little space suits. What? You know, like men from Mars, okay? Midgets. And I want some movie extras, uh, maybe 50 of them. Also rigged up like men from Mars. Make them look gruesome. Got that? Gruesome. Also, I need some horses with uh, pretty girls on top of them. 
Maybe you can get that bunch from Maroney's Traveling Circus, the ones we booked for the Fireman's Parade in Albany last year. I'll try, sir. And never mind the expense. Just get me the talent, okay? I, uh, I uh, gotta hang up now. Uh, call me back, Benny. How you doing, Oliver? Oh, fine, Mr. Ryan, just fine. We got full-page ads and all the dailies and 10-second spot announcements on every local station, <laughs> but it's costing a fortune. The more it costs, the bigger our percentage. Spend like you are going to the electric chair, Oliver. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, how are you making out on the parade? If it comes off, it'll be the biggest thing since Barnum invented the midget. I've got Macy's, Gimbal's, and Saks to contribute floats. Everything is built around the Martian theme, see? Even the horses will have long feelers attached to them and uh, funny-looking extra legs. It'll be sensational. Oh, yeah, yeah, it sounds fine, only, uh... Only what? Oh, well, Mr. Ryan, we don't even know what we're selling. <laughs> Oliver, my boy, do you think old Sid Ryan has been sitting here spending all this moolah and not putting two and two together? You mean you know who Lushar represents? Just by accident, understand? I have learned that Century Pictures is making a big new epic. A space opera entitled Invasion from Mars. Get it? Oh, oh, I begin to see. Uh, also, by mere coincidence, it happens to be the premiere sometime around June 1st. You follow me? But, Mr. Ryan, Century has an exclusive contract with New Feature Syndicate for all their publicity. Suppose Century Pictures doesn't like the way New Features is handling their stuff. They want to get out of the contract, but New Features says no. So they have to get around the contract. A man named Lucia, client unknown, starts publicizing the Martian invasion. Need I go further? Oh, I get it, Mr. Ryan. I... Gee, I suppose I should have thought of that. No, Oliver, that's what I like about you. You're so innocent. <laughs> yeah, let me talk to Commissioner Patrick, please. Sid Ryan. Hello? Kamish, Sid Ryan. Oh, it's you. <laughs> well, what is it this time? If you want to drop a man off the Empire State Building into a teacup full of water, the answer is no. <laughs> also, we are not arresting any fan dancers. You know I don't handle fan dancers. I want a permit for a parade, June 1st, 5th Avenue. It's a Sunday. There's no traffic. Oh, come now. Look, Ryan. Macy's gets a permit. Gimbel's gets a permit. The American Legion gets a permit. The Sons of Aaron march every time Morton Downey sings the Wearing of the Green. Don't give me a hard time, Patrick. This is too big. Come on I now. have the Fifth Avenue Merchants Association behind me. Okay, Ryan. Fill out the forms. I'll pass them along to the license commissioner. That's my boy. Oh, by the way, what's the occasion? Oh, don't you read the papers, Patrick? June 1st is Martian Day. Well, Mr. Ryan, how is the campaign going? Like fire, Mr. Lushaw, like fire. Everybody and his brother is going along with the gag. Yesterday, we distributed 50,000 Martian hats to school kids. I even arranged for Commissioner Patrick to accept a $50,000 check for the Policeman's Benevolent Fund from the man from Mars. <laughs> Excellent. I, um... I understand Century Pictures spend over a million bucks making that space opera. A big pardon? Oh, come, come, Mr. Lucia. Sid Ryan wasn't born yesterday, you know. I know who our client is, even if you don't admit it. You do? Always thinking that's me. Well, as long as you know, let's keep it to ourselves, shall we, Mr. Ryan? As you once remarked, when these things leak out, it destroys the surprise and ruins the effectiveness of the campaign. <laughs> speaking to from our portable transmitter atop the reviewing stand for the much-heralded Martian Parade on Fifth Avenue. It's a beautiful sunlit day here in New York. A perfect day for a parade. And the streets are packed with thousands of spectators, all eager to find out what this is all about. There's an air of, of shrill expectancy. Run over here! Okay, tell them all right. Uh, I just had word from Sal Brown up at Central Park Mall that the Martians have landed from big pink balloons. And uh, while we're waiting here for the arrival of the parade, we brought some people up to our microphone to tell you their reactions to this spectacular affair. Uh, uh, what's your name, madam? Miss Ada Shackley. A little louder, please. Miss Ada Shackley. And uh, where are you from, Mrs. Shackley? Hello. Columbus, 
Ohio. I see. Mama. I see you have your family with you. Two little curly-headed boys. Uh, are you in New York for your vacation? Yeah, we came for the Shriners Convention with their daddy. Well, uh, Mama, Mama, what, give what do you me think of Martian Day, Mrs. Shackley? Well, it all seems very strange to me, but the boys have been pestering me to watch it, so we've been standing here for two hours. I can't make head or tail of it. Uh, well, neither can a lot of other people, Mrs. Shackley, but judging by the thousands here already, there's a lot of curiosity. Curiosity killed a cat, Mama. folks say. Uh, let's hope not. Uh, thank you, Mrs. Shackley. And now, here's the... Here they come, ladies and gentlemen. The first units of the big Martian parade swinging down Fifth Avenue. With fanfare, colored streamers, music, confetti, floats, all the trappings of a Mardi Gras. Let's listen to the band for a minute. Here in the vanguard, the whole group of little midgets in weird-looking pink and blue spacesuits carrying Rube Goldberg weapons with signs painted on them. I can read one which says Atomic Blaster. Another has a placard reading, We're Martian Through Georgia. <laughs> and here come the clowns, laughing and falling all over each other. They're giving free sugar candy to the kids along the way. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, there's a happy, laughing crowd along Fifth Avenue today. A true reflection of a great sense of humor and good nature that makes America the place it is. Why only... What's this? The crowd's murmuring now. They've fallen somewhat silent. There's something coming. I'll try to get it for you. What? Uh, oh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, here comes the Martian contingent. This is promised as the climax of the show. And now a great hush has fallen over the crowd. It's quite a sight to see these thousands of people standing here expectantly, hearing only the great regular sigh of their mass breathing. Now here they come, ladies and gentlemen, the Martians, marching in booted, helmeted ranks, row after row of them. This is an impressive sight, ladies and gentlemen, and around a serious contrast to the rest of these, the joyous slapstick parade we've been witnessing up and now. There are perhaps, oh, 200 tall, broad-chested men dressed in metallic gray spacesuits with thick glass visors drawn across their faces. Each one's holding an ominous-looking ray gun at the ready position, and marching in absolute silence. Keeping step perfectly, as though some new unspoken command were marking time for them. Even the children are awed by the unexpected warlike realism of the Martian Legion. And now the first ranks of the Martians move past us, down Fifth Avenue, toward the reviewing stands at the square. No one moves. <laughs> uh -oh. There, a, a woman, a woman, ladies and gentlemen, just dashed out into the street. For what reason, I don't know. She just slipped through the police cordon somehow. They're after her now, but she's already reached the ranks of the marches, and she's trying to lift the visor of one of the Martian space teams. Wait, wait. She's fallen. She screamed and then fell forward in a dead faint. The Martian column keeps right on coming. Unless they break ranks, they're going to trample her. No, no, no. The police have, policemen have got her now. They're, they're dragging her away, out of the way. They're trying to revive her now. What is that? Uh, all sorts of rumors have begun filtering back through the crowd. Some are even whispering that the woman's dead. We don't know yet, but whatever's happened, the incident seems to have cast a slight shadow over the mood of the crowd. The carefree holiday air seems to have vanished, the crowd stirring uneasily, a little disturbed at what we've, what we've just seen. But nothing to be alarmed at, however. It just, it just seems a shame that anything like this should happen to spoil our enjoyment of the Martian parade. Dimension X will continue in just a moment. It's National Wheaties Week. I want to take that again, Frank? Oh, sure. It's National Wheaties Week, and we're celebrating. And that voice you heard belongs to my severest critic, who is here to help us celebrate tonight. He's the fellow who's backstage when I'm telling you about the Wheaties. He listens to see that I tell you right. Wheaties' best friend, next to me, Blaine Butcher. Uh, I think you took that introduction a little fast, Frank. Uh, now, <laughs> you suppose, see uh... what I mean, folks? Seriously, Blaine, you say the Wheaties words once. Okay, all I'll say is this. Those of us who tell the Wheaties story believe what we say. And during National Wheaties Week, the good word is this. Get a package of Wheaties and try them just once. I'll be right behind you in line at your grocers between you and Frank Martin. Okay, do that now. Try Wheaties. It's National Wheaties Week.
Mr. Ryan, did you see that? A woman fainted. She ran out into the street to get a close look at the Martians. Then, then she screamed and fainted dead away. I'm well aware of that, Oliver, since I paid her 50 bucks to do it. What? The dramatic moment, Oliver. The stock and trade of the good publicity man. Relax. Holy smokes, you sure think of everything. For my share of this deal, roughly $100,000, I can afford to think of everything. Shut the window. Well, okay, but don't you want to see the finish? We'll go down to the reviewing stand for the finish. Right now, I want to make a phone call. Uh, by the way, where's Lucia? Oh, I haven't seen him. Well, uh, close the window, Oliver. Well, I... Okay, Mr. Ryan. Marcus Talent Agency. Benny? This is Sid Ryan. Oh, I say, listen, Sid, I was going to call you. I'm awful sorry about those Martians. What do you mean, sorry? They're terrific. No, don't joke, Sid. I mean it. Oh, I mean it, too. They're great, great. Are you in a bag? Never felt better. You mean it, don't you? Of course I mean it. What is this? There are Martians in the parade? About 150. Of course, I only ordered 50, Sid. but under the circumstances... Sid. What is it? Sid, don't you know, I couldn't get you a single movie extra. There's a studio strike in New York. Uh huh? Wait a minute. Where'd these guys come from if you didn't hire them? I don't know. Hold on. Oliver. Oh, yes, Mr. Ryan? Did you hire those Martians? Well, no, sir. I didn't... Benny, hire... this is on the level, isn't it? Honest, Sid, I... W okay, Benny, I'll, I'll call you back. What's the matter, Mr. Ryan? I don't know. Just don't know. Wonderful shot. What's um, Century Pictures number? Tremaine 4, 1000. Tremaine 4, 1000. Century Pictures, the studio of the stars. Uh, give me Marty Sanford, your publicity director. One moment, please. Sanford? Uh, Marty, this is Sid Ryan. Oh, hello, Sid. How's the... Fine, fine. Listen, Marty, this is dead serious. On the level, get it? What's wrong? I've got to locate Lucia. Uh, Lou who? Lucia, come on now, Marty. This is life and death. The guy you sent over to hire me for the invasion picture. I never heard of a guy named Lucia. And, uh... What invasion picture? Invasion from Mars, the space opera. Are you batty? Marty. That picture was shelved last month. What? Sure, back in the can. The big shots decided you can't sell a Martian invasion to the American public. It's too incredible, Sid. <laughs> Who'd ever believe it could really happen? Of all the crazy... Mother in heaven. What is it, Mr. Ryan? You look terrible. That's, that's too fantastic. Fanta Mr. Ryan, is something wrong? Open that window. I, I want another look at those Martians. Look at him. Oliver, you were in the army. Could 150 movie extras learn to march like that in, say, uh, 24 hours? No. Not in 24 days, Mr. Ryan. Not a second's hesitation. Not one other step. Look at the way they carry those ray guns at the ready. The only other time I've seen troops march like that was in a film of the Nazi SS troops marching through the streets of Paris. Mr. Ryan... Oliver, get down there. Find that woman who painted. Her name's Gloria Montez. Get her up here. Make it fast. <laughs> yes, yes, Mr. Ryan. I can't get much sense out of her. Stay away from me. Okay, Gloria. You can cut out the act and relax. Don't it's me, me. Don't Sid Ryan. Me. You're a Martian. Gloria, settle You're down. A mask. Baby, I it's me, Sid. It. It's awful. It, it's all big green eyes and the Baby, snap out of it. Listen, what happened down there? You ran out and screamed like I told you, but the fainting, that wasn't in the act. Go away, please. Go away. Just one question, baby. Inside that helmet, what did you see? I can't get anything out of her, Mr. Ryan. She needs a doctor. Okay, Oliver. I've heard enough anyway. You take care of Gloria here. Get her a drink. Where are you going? To see the commissioner. You've got to stop this parade before things begin to happen. Okay, Ryan, what's the beef? Listen, Patrick, I don't know what it is, see, but something's wrong. You've got to stop that parade. I suppose you'd like the riot squad. That would get you a front-page spread on every paper in town. Now, look, Ryan, I've got no time for your cheap publicity gags. I'm a busy man. Listen, I'm trying to tell you I don't know where those Martians came from, who they are, anything about them. Oh, Ryan, I'm wise to your tricks. Now, if you let the sergeant show you out... You won't do it, huh? An honest citizen appeals for protection and you refuse... I most emphatically do. Now beat it. All right, Patrick. I'll go right to the mayor's office. I'll have you busted flatter than the fried egg. Go ahead. 
I'm sure His Honor will be glad to toss you out on that phony nickel-plated skull of yours. You heard me, Ryan. You can't see the man. Adolf, please. This isn't a gag. I don't want publicity. All I want to do is maybe prevent something horrible from happening. In case you don't know it, wise guy, something horrible is already happening. A couple of hundred little kids are in the hospital with tamain poisoning from that phony Martian candy you passed out. What? Or didn't you know? I... I didn't. We've got to stop that parade. Sure. You'd like nothing better than to start a panic now. Maybe a few hundred people get trampled to death. Think of the newspaper space. That'd get you and your phony product. I won't stand for this, Adolf. This may be a matter of life and death. Get out of here, quick. It'll be your death. Go on, beat it. Get out. You and your publicity, sons. Make me sick to my stomach. Oliver? Oliver? Oliver, where are you? Oliver, I... Oliver? Oliver! It is useless to scream at him, Mr. Ryan. Your friend is quite dead. Lucia. He wanted to run to the police with some story about a Martian invasion. I found it necessary to restrain him. Restrain him, you stinking murderer! Now, now, Mr. Ryan, collect yourself. After all our planning, it wouldn't do to have everything spoiled now, would it? Lucia, I'll start talking and talk fast, because when you get through, I'm going to take you apart piece by piece. What's this all about? Surely you know, Mr. Ryan. After all, you've been publicizing it for months... You see, before colonizing your planet, the Martian government sent some of us as scouts in advance, disguised as Earthmen, of course, to study your habits, your weaknesses. We found that the people on Earth are predominantly conditioned by advertising and publicity. And so we conceived the idea of treating our entire invasion as a vast publicity stunt. (laughs) Clever, yes? After all, Mr. Ryan, who would suspect an invader who advertised his invasion in the newspaper, invited the public to his surprise attack, and spent millions publicizing his plans? Holy jumping... You've done very well, you see. Then there was no product. Ah, but there is a product. The product is death. What are you trying, Lucia? We Martians are a humane people, Mr. Ryan. We do not like to destroy thousands where a few hundred will suffice. In exactly two minutes... Our troops will treat the world to a spectacle of death, which will bring the rest of your planet to its knees in horror. Nations will clamor to surrender. Perhaps, Mr. Lucia, but not if I can help... No, 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 no! Yes, please? Operator, this is Mr. Ryan. Get me the field telephone on the reviewing stand of the Martian Day Parade. Hurry. Anyone in particular? Just hurry. Give me Commissioner Patrick. Hello? Hello? You have to talk louder. I want Commissioner Patrick. Hello? Patrick, Patrick. Hey, wait a minute. Things are quieting down. Hey, wait a minute. What was that you wanted? This is Ryan. I have to talk to the commissioner. It's a matter of life and death. Oh, you can't talk to him now. The chief Martian is presenting the PBA check to him. The Martians are going to fire a salute. Listen, you got to stop him. What? Stop him! I'm sorry, Mr. Ryan. I can't hear you. You idiot. The worst is going... <laughs> Doesn't matter. Nothing matters now. Tonight, Dimension X has transcribed the parade. An original radio drama written by George Lefferts. Featured in the cast were Joseph Curtin as Ryan, Barry Kroger as Lushar, and Alexander Scurby as Ron Heilman. Your narrator was Norman Rose. Music by Albert Berman. Engineer Bill Chambers. Dimension X is produced by Van Woodward and directed by Edward King. In a moment, we'll tell you about next week's show. And now, here is your Wheaties man, Frank Martin. It's National Wheaties Week. Have you had them today? Had your Wheaties? It's National Wheaties Week, the time of the year to buy Wheaties and try them at least once, for goodness sake. Because once you sit down to a bowl of Wheaties with milk and the fruit of your choice, I don't worry about you. Nope, 
I know there's a whole kernel of wheat in every Wheaties flake, and that's good. Besides, I know that starting a better breakfast with Wheaties can help you feel better, look better, and work better all morning. But honest now, you have to do your part before Wheaties can do theirs. Sure, buy Wheaties. That's what you have to do. That's what I have to do. Buy them and see how Wheaties at 7 can help at 11. And a happy National Wheaties Week to you. Listen next week when we present the Robert Heinlein story, The Roads Must Roll, another adventure into the world of tomorrow, the world of... Dimension X. And this is the Wheaties man, Frank Martin, inviting you to listen Saturday, that's tomorrow night, to Joel McRae in Tales of the Texas Rangers on the Wheaties Big Parade. See you then. And remember, it's National Wheaties Week. Swing your partners right and left. It's National Wheaties Week. Come on, everybody, to the Wheaties party. Eat a lot of Wheaties like the champions do. Dance together cheek to cheek. This is National Wheaties Week. Eat a lot of Wheaties like the champions do. Wheaties, a breakfast, a champion. This program came to you from New York. Jack Late's coming up October 6th. It's Bill Bendix on NBC. Exciting news for adventure seekers. Join us on a thrilling journey through the vibrant landscapes and diverse culture of Brazil. Lost in Brazil brings you to captivating videos showcasing heart-pounding adventures, mouth-watering cuisine, hidden gems of this incredible country. From bustling cities to tranquil beaches, our videos capture the essence of Brazil's beauty, experience the warmth of its people, the rhythm of its music, and the thrill of exploration. Click on the link in the description to find out more. Adventures in time and space, transcribed in future tense. Can you predict the future? Can you tell what will come in a hundred years, or in ten, or in the next minute? Tonight, Dimension X brings you a glimpse of what may well happen within your own lifetime. The Robert Heinlein story, The Roads Must Roll. It was in the middle 1950s that the automotive age began to die. The traffic engineers had long expected it. For years, they had watched our vast cities sprawl and spread out, spill over into the countryside, become more and more dependent on motor transportation. And then finally, the inevitable breaking point was reached. The growing flood of cars and buses and trucks began to swamp the streets and arterial highways. The building of roads could no longer keep pace. The superhighways clogged, congested, became packed with cars, stalled bumper to bumper, and the cities began to die of slow strangulation, for the traffic could no longer roll. Then the engineers took over. They banned the automobiles, tore up the superhighways, and in their place they built the rolling roads. Mechanized roads that moved like huge conveyor belts, whirling along on their giant rotors at speeds ranging from 5 to 100 miles an hour, carrying the freight, the food, and the people from city to city and coast to coast. An engineering miracle had changed the face of a nation. The automobiles and railroads vanished. The rolling roads had taken over all transportation. And no one worried over the fact 
that if the roads should ever stop, our whole economic life would stop. For the machinery had never failed yet. The machinery that rolled the roads was perfect. But people forgot that machinery depends on men, the men who run it. belong here since I'm no engineer. Uh, I'm just here to represent the workers' union. But uh, I want to know what's all the shooting for. You engineers have got better working conditions than we have, and we ain't kicking. You say you engineers are powerful. You say you can tie up the roads. That's right. Well, listen, so can any screwball with a jar of nitroglycerin. Hey, what's he yeah, and he don't need no engineering degree neither. Are you speaking for your union now? Or are you here as a stooge for the Transport Commission? Yeah. <laughs> well, listen, I, I helped found my union, and I led the strike in 75 for decent working conditions. Where were you engineers then, huh? With the thing! <laughs> Remember, you're only a guest at this meeting. Go on, man. Now, listen, man. I'm one of the old engineers on the roads. You all are. Uh, worked up the hard work. We didn't go to the fancy technical institutes like those young punk cadets the commission is training to take over our jobs. Jim Gaines, don't fill us full of the old school spirit and that baloney about how the roads must roll. <laughs> so all right then. Why don't we get smart for a change? What would happen if the roads stopped rolling? Maybe the country would begin to realize that they can't do without us. And maybe we'd begin to get the things we want. All right, put her on. Jim, I want you to stop off on your way home. And I'm get... sorry, darling, I can't make it. Oh, but you promised. Yes, I know, but Washington called in. They're sending Evans, the Australian Minister of Transport, through my sector today. I've got to show him through personally. Well, can't somebody else? Well, I'm chief supervisor. It wouldn't be courteous. Darling, courtesy begins at home. I've planned this dinner for weeks. Honey, the roads must roll. Uh, Jim, if you quote that nauseating slogan at me again, I'll divorce you. <laughs> Well, I can't help it, darling. I tell you, I'll meet you at Stockton at nine. We'll take in a show. Yeah. Kiss Alan goodnight for me. Well, all right, dear. <laughs> Goodbye. Bye, darling. Yes, Mr. Evans is here. Yes, send him in. Go right in, sir. Well, good evening, Mr. Evans. I'm Gaines, chief engineer. How do you do, Mr. Gaines? Won't you sit down? Thank you. Ah. Um, they told me at the embassy you'd be the man to see. Oh, I want to know how the roads work. I think we can handle that. I'm not a technical man, Mr. Gaines. My field is sociology. I suppose you tell me about the roads as if I were entirely ignorant. Well, fine, fine. <laughs> well, it's nearly dinner time. Suppose we run up to Stockton sector for dinner. All right. Take us about an hour on the roads and you can see them working. Excellent. If you'll excuse me for a minute. Hi, Chief. What can I do for you? 
Oh, Dave, you're on the evening watch, huh? Where's Van Cleek? Oh, I'm going to some meeting. I'm going up to Stockton for dinner. Anything to report? No, sir. The roads are rolling. Okay, keep them rolling. All right, Mr. Evans, let's go. This, this here is the low-speed strip. You ever ridden a conveyor before? No. That's well, quite simple. Remember to face the motion of the strip as you get on. Well, that's it. All right. <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll go right across here. Each adjoining strip is a few miles an hour faster than the one next to it. I see. Freight is carried on the 50-mile strip. Most passenger traffic is on the express strip. Oh, yeah. All right, now, watch your step. Here we are, maximum speed. 100 miles an hour. Amazing. <laughs> this strip makes a round trip San Diego to Reno in 12 hours. Oh. Oh, here's the restaurant. Ready to eat? Is this a restaurant? There's a sign, Jake's Steakhouse, fastest meal on the road. Is, is it really a proper restaurant? Well, the best. Hooked right into the moving strip, of course. Shall we go in? <laughs> <laughs> oh, hello, hello there, Mr. Gaines. We don't see much of you out on the road. Well, busy in the office, Jake. Oh, <laughs> too, eh? right this way. <laughs> uh, thank you. Here we are. Now... What'll it be? Well, you order, Jake. Well, um, how about a stick? Two inches thick from a steer that died happy. <laughs> oh, that's <laughs> fine. That's <laughs> nice. Uh, plug me in the intercom, will you, Jake? Sure, there's a talk box right next to you. Flank two, Ryan! If you'll excuse me, Mr. Evans. Davidson on watch. Uh, this is the chief, Davidson. I'm at Jake's Steakhouse. You can reach me at 10L66. 10L66, right. Oh, no. I can get a hold of me in an emergency now. Mr. Gaines, what kind of an emergency could there be? Well, two principally. Power failure on the rotors would bring the road to a standstill. Mm -hmm. If that happened during rush hour, we'd have to evacuate millions of people. Well, well, as many as that? Oh, yes, easily. There are 12 million people dependent on this section of road. Oh. Gaines here. Hello, Chief. David. I just got the hourly reports in. Proceed. Could that engineer Gunther, while on watch, was found playing cards with C.J. Ross, technician on duty. Any damage? One rotor running hot, but still synchronized. It was tacked down and replaced. All right, have the paymaster give Ross his time, turn him over to civil authorities. Place Cadet Gunther under arrest, bring him to Road Town Central. Yes, sir. All right, keep him rolling. As I was saying, Evans, there are two possibilities of danger. Can you visualize what would happen if the strip under us would break? I, uh, I hadn't thought of that. You don't realize you're traveling at uh, 100 miles an hour. <laughs> well, it can't break, not now. The strip has a safety factor of over 12 to 1. <laughs> this is good soup, Jake. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Gaines. But you know, Evans, a break did happen once in the early days. That was on the Philadelphia-Jersey City Road. Dear yeah, me, no. That's right. The strip wasn't much more than a conveyor belt then. You know, it buckled for miles, crushing passengers against the roof. Yeah. Forward section in front of the brakes spilled them down under into the rotors and the rollers. And, uh, was it uh, very bad? Over 3,000 people were killed in that break. But, Evans, the roads had to go on. You know, the entire economic system hangs on the roads. If they stopped now, the country would starve. Isn't it possible that you've become too dependent on these roads, Mr. Gaines? For example, what if you had a strike? Uh, we had a strike back in 75, but... Well, there's not much danger of that anymore. Oh, no? why not? Every cadet that goes to work on the roads today is a graduate of the United States Transport Academy. Oh, I see. They're all picked men, screened for emotional stability. They're trained to give us the same kind of loyalty that Annapolis and West Point develop in their men. Now, you're a graduate, I suppose, Mr. Gaines? No, no, I, I was too old for that. The academy wasn't set up till after the strike in 75. But it won't be long now, maybe five or ten years, Evans, before the oldest engineer on the roads is a man who's who's been through that academy. Now, yeah, Gaines here. Davidson, Chief, there's trouble in Sacramento. Sanger. What is it? What's happening? Emergency, stop. Hello. Hello, Davidson. The phones must be out. Come on. Jake! Jake! Hey, what is it? What's the matter? Have everybody stay in the restroom, Jake. What's that? Probably somebody stepped onto the next trip. Got cut to ribbons. There'll be plenty of casualties. Jake, where's your getaway hat? In the pantry. Well, how am I going to help those people? I've got the whole road to think of. Now, don't bother me. Give me a hand, Jake. This hat's just stuck here. All right, if you're coming with me, Mr. Evans, you've got to move fast. I haven't got any time to waste. Where are we now? 
freeway on top of the inner road ceiling, though. Know. That's the outer shell over us there. But are we going outside? No, there'll be an excess down manhole over here. They're spaced every hundred feet. Mm -hmm. It's there by the green light. I got you. Oh. All right, this will get us down on the northbound road. Careful now, it's dark. All right. Stand away from that door, Heaven. But this road is still rolling. Yeah, so it is. It was only the 100-mile strip that stopped. There's what I want, a phone booth. Look out, Evans. Excuse me, will you? Hey! Out. I I'm talking to my wife. What Don't do argue. Mean? I'll... I'm the phone. Emergency priority. Division office. Davidson? Gaines here. Report. Chief, where you been? I've been calling. Never mind that report. 709 report. Strip 20 past emergency level. Interlocks acted and cut the strip out. Cause of failure unknown. Direct communication to Sacramento control office out. Evacuation of strip 20 commenced. No casualties. There are casualties. I saw them. Put police and hospital routine A into operation. Get me Van Cleek. I want him to take over for me till I report him. We can't reach him, Chief. Shall I cut out the rest of the road? No, keep those other strips rolling or we'll have a traffic jam the devil himself couldn't untangle. There are five million passengers on that road now. Notify the governor that I've assumed emergency authority. Arm all cadets available and await orders. Shall I recall technicians off watch? No, this isn't an engineering failure, man. That whole sector went out simultaneously. Somebody cut those rotors by hand. Now, I want all available senior class cadets to report to Stockton Subsector Office 10 with pistols and tear gas. Yes, sir. Oh, uh, the, the governor wants to talk to you. He called in. Refer him to somebody else. I'm busy. I'll get back to you. I'm going down under. can't hear without an anti-noise filter. All right, come on. What are we looking for? A recon car. There should be one here. Are those the rotors? Yeah, the big ones are rotors. They drive the road. The little ones are rollers. They give continuous support. I see. Oh, there's a watch gang now, jacking down a rotor. Can they hear us? No, the noise filter works on a four-foot radius. I'll flash them. <laughs> he sees the light. Is that Wilson reporting, sir? I want your recon car, emergency. Yes, sir. Right over here, sir. Come on, Evans. Get in. Well, it's so small. Oh, well, you fit. All right. All right, now. Hang on. She accelerates like a rocket. Oh, my stomach. Oh. Relay station. This is Gaines. Get me Davidson, senior watch officer. Mr. Gaines, the mayor wants to talk. I haven't got time. Get me Davidson. Leave this circuit hooked into Davidson's board until I tell you to cut it. Yes. Davidson. Gaines calling. Have you found out yet what's stopping the roads? No, sir. It's still a mystery to me. All right. I'm on my way in a recon car. Hold everything till I get there. Cadet Edmonds reporting, sir. Three platoons of cadet engineers standing by with tumblebug motorcycles. Are they armed? Pistols and tear gas is ordered. All right, good. Assistant Supervisor Van Cleek is calling you on Circuit 9. Well, it's about time. Cut me in. Yes, sir. Hello, Van. Where are you? Sacramento office. Uh, Sacramento, that's good. Report. In a pig's eye. What? I'm not your deputy anymore, Gaines. Va Van, what are you talking about? Now, don't interrupt me and you'll find out. It's true, Gaines. I haven't picked the director of the engineer's control committee. We're taking over. Have you gone off your rotor? You can't start. Strip 20 until I'm ready to let you. Van. I can stop the whole road if I have to. Van, Van Creek, I'll call in the army. How'll you get him here if the roads aren't rolling, eh? Listen, Gaines. Whoever controls the roads controls the country. And right now, that happens to be me. Sign off, Gaines. I've got to call the White House. You behave yourself. You won't get hurt. I don't believe it, sir. He's got us, Edmonds. If we go in and blast him out, he may wreck the road. What's your rolling tonnage now? 53% under evening peak, sir. How about strip 20? Almost evacuated. Yeah. Listen in on this, Davidson. Standing by, Chief. I'm going down inside with these cadets. We're going to work north, overcoming any resistance that we may meet. The watch technicians and maintenance crews are to follow behind us. Each rotor, as they come to it, is to be cut out from under Sacramento's control 
then hooked into the Stockton control board. You understand? You got it. Jack. If it works right, we can move control of Sacramento sector right out from under Van's feet. And he can stay in his office there till he's hungry enough to be reasonable. Edmonds, get me a pistol. Now, Mr. Gaines, there's a man here, and he's badly hurt. He wants to see you. Take care of him. I haven't got time to... He's from Sacramento sector. What? Sir. Send him in here. Mr. Gaines. Mr. Gaines. Take, take it easy, Mr. Mr. Gaines. You're... I... You're Harvey from the mechanic show. Actually, you're not... I tried to warn you. Tried to get away. He shot me three times. Uh, get a doctor, will you? All right, now. <laughs> easy, easy, Harvey. Harvey, how long has this been building up? Isn't the man? It's the engineers. I, I told them they were crazy. Told them the roads got to roll. And when I tried to get away, to... easy now. Bleeding from the mouth. Harvey. 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 Can you hear me? He's dead, Mr. Gaines. Come on, Edmonds. We better move. All right, you men. You saw Harvey brought in. How many of you want a chance to kill the louse that did it? All right, men. Anybody who hasn't got his mind on his job will be in the way. Now, here's the order. We move north, mounted on tumblebugs. We're going to try to regain control, rotor by rotor, before Sacramento sector knows what we're moving. Now, we've got to capture any watch personnel we run on before they can get word back, you understand? Man, surprise is vital. Use tear gas when possible. Shoot only when necessary. But get them before they can reach a phone jack. Any questions? No? Then move out. What's the score, Edmonds? 33 prisoners so far. No one killed Crook. For years since I rode one of these tumble bugs, uh, forgotten how to steer it. There's, there's a man ahead. There at the rotor base. Yeah, he's got a phone jacked in. Hurry. If he gets word back, we're sunk. I, I don't think he's seen us. I'll dismount and get him. All right, Edmonds. Hold! We're out fire! Quick, he sees us. Come here, you. Out. He's got a gun. Oh. I got him, sir. I got him. Grab his gun. Yeah, he had an intercom jacked in, all right. Yeah. If he's got through to Sacramento office, it's going to be tough. I don't know, sir. Maybe he can get the call through. Listen. The road. Take off your noise filter. There. It's the road. The road is stopping. Halt your man. Halt. Hold up there. Hold up. Edmonds, there's a recon car coming up. Relay station call for Mr. Gaines and the recon speaker. Give it to me. Here you are, sir. Gaines here. Davidson here, Chief. Van Cleek's calling you. Who stopped the road? He did. Oh, he did, did he? All right, cut Van Cleek into me. You thought I was falling, eh, Gaines? What do you think now? All right, Van. The road has stopped. You've won this trick. Then why don't you get smart and give up? You can't win. You forgot something, Van. You can't lick the whole country. Yeah? Gaines, I've got a switch button in my hand. If I'll push it, it'll blow 300 yards straight across the road. And then, for good measure, I'll take an axe and wreck the control station before I leave. That's pretty drastic, Van. Yeah? If I blow this charge in the middle of Sacramento sector, it'll get an awful lot of people. There are plenty of shopkeepers still on Strip 20. That row of apartment house is next to the road will go. Now, look, Van, uh, you don't want to blow the road, neither do I. Uh, suppose, Van, I come up to your headquarters and we talk this over. Two reasonable men ought to be able to make a settlement. Is this some kind of a trick? I'll come alone, unarmed. My men will stay here. All right. All right, Gaines. But one long rope and I blow the road. Well, we've, we've got to hurry, Dave. If I take too long, Van Cleek will get edgy and set off that charge. I can't understand it. The psych tests are rigid. We've never had a failure in the hum with burton method. Then, suddenly, a whole sector goes sour. How could Van Cleek get a whole crew of psych-cleared men to revolt? It's easy, Dave. As my deputy, he was ex-officio personnel officer for the whole road. He must have been faking psych records for years, transferring maladjusted men into his sector. I've got that personnel record, Mr. Gaines. Oh, thank you. This is Van's record here. Masked, introvert, inferiority rating seven, and comment... 
In spite of potential instability shown on Wadsworth Curve, this officer is especially adept in handling men. Uh, he's adept, all right. I haven't got time for any more, Dave. Chief, are you actually going up there to Van Cleek's office? I've got to. They'll be armed. They'll kill you. I'm going to take that chance. Why don't you call in the army? He won't dare blow the road then. Yes, he would. Look at that psych record there. He's putting up a big, brave front, but he's rotten inside. He wants to be taken seriously. He wants everybody to think he's the most dangerous man in this country. If I call the army in, he'll try to prove it by blowing the road. But how can you stop him, Mr. Gaines? He'll have a gun. What'll you have? What'll I have? Only a prayer. And what I know about Mr. Van Cleek. <laughs> All right, Gaines. Director Van Cleek will see you now. Gaines, I want you to sign this now. The declaration of your recognition of the Engineers Control Committee. You've got one minute to sign it, Gaines, or I'll... I'll push this button and blow up the whole sector. You better sign, Gaines. You need this gorilla with the gun, Van? Why are you? Can't you handle one unarmed man alone? All right, Harry, out. But out, out. Yeah. Okay. All right. Now sign. <laughs> What's so funny? You are. You are, man. You start a revolution because you think the engineers should control the road. Then when you've got control, the only thing you can think of to do is to blow it up. That's kind of silly, isn't it? Tell me what you're so scared of. I'm not scared. Yeah, sitting there sweating all over that push button that you're holding. If your buddies knew how afraid you were, they'd probably throw you into the rotor. I'm not afraid. <laughs> you're afraid of me right now, Van. You're afraid I'll have you on the car. You've got one minute to You're afraid the cadets won't salute you. You're afraid that they're laughing at you behind your back. No, 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 I'm not. You keep quiet now. I've got a gun yeah, here. Yeah, you're afraid of using the wrong fork at dinner. You're afraid people are looking at you, Van, laughing at you. I am you. not. I am not. Yeah, you dirty stuck-up snob. <laughs> Just because you went to a high-hat school, you think you're better than everybody, huh? You and your crummy little gold braid cadet. Van, you're a pathetic little shrimp. I understand you perfectly, Van. You're a third-rater. All your life, you've been afraid that someone would send you to the foot of the class, so you ride out on your ear where you belong. I don't want to look at you anymore. You young... I'll show you. I'll put a bullet in you. Put down that pop gun before you hurt yourself. Don't you come near me now. Don't you come near... I'll shoot. I'll shoot now. Give me I'll... that, Van. I... Oh, let me go, will you? Give me that pistol. Yeah. I thought if I wounded your little ego, you'd forget to push that button and pull a trigger instead. I'm not afraid. I'm afraid you'll never make a good executive, Van. They have to know when to punch buttons. Oh. No, no, I'm not. Gaines here. Chief, are you all right? I... Yeah, I'm all right. Attack now, Davidson. Mop up. I'll hold the control room. I've, I've got Van Cleek. I think his little revolution is just about over. Mr. Gaines. Mr. Gaines. Oh, Mr. Evans, I forgot about you. I've been waiting at the sector office. Yes. Is everything under control? Yes, all's rolling. Those are the watch engineers going under to check Sacramento sector inch by inch now. Remarkable organization. Remarkable. Well, thank you. Powerly's in chief. San Diego Circle rolling. Bakersfield, Fresno, Stockton. 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 Oh. What's oh, no. What's the matter, Chief? It's trouble, Mr. Gaines? Well, there sure is. I promised to meet my wife at Stockton for a show. She's been waiting there since 9 o'clock last night. Oh, dear me. Dave, uh, Dave, see if you can get her for me. Try the sector office. All right, Chief. And, and Dave... Uh, see if you can calm her down. Huh? Oh, sure, Chief, sure. Uh, I'll tell her the road must roll. No, no, don't tell her that. I, I don't think she'd appreciate that. She's heard it too often. Well, I better get going. Bye, Dave. Keep them rolling. rolling along. Keep them rolling. And the roadways go rolling along. You have just heard another adventure into the unknown world of the future. The world of... Dimension X. Next week, 
the strange story of the test pilot who became the first man ever to invade outer space and of what he found when he got there. Listen next week to The Outer Limit. Tonight's adventures in Dimension X. The Roads Must Roll was written by Robert Heinlein and adapted for radio by Ernest Canoy. Featured in the cast were Wendell Holmes as Gaines and Ralph Bell as Van Cleek. Your host was Norman Rose. Music by Albert Berman. Engineer Bill Chambers. Dimension X is produced by Van Woodward and directed by Edward King. Transcribed in future tense. Dimension X. Can you predict what will come in 100 years, or in 10, or in the next minute? Some people think they can. Nuclear science, mathematicians, astronomers, biologists. They'll predict the shape of the future because they make the future. Because they see beyond the known dimensions of time and space into the unknown dimension X. We go ahead now in time to 1965. We're on a vast concrete runway set in the desert of the southwest. A giant metal ship stands before us prow pointed for the stars, and in five minutes the signal will flash and it will tear up through the atmosphere to the outer limit. Attention, attention, clear field for takeoff. Clear field. Five minutes, Steve. For right. takeoff. Warm her up, Charlie. Better over. I want to go over procedure again, Steve. Don't worry, I got it straight. We just make sure. Okay. I take her up on jets to 50,000, then I cut in the rocket. No lower, or your tail blast will burn out three counters. I climb four minutes on rockets, then start maneuver test. Remember that, no more than four minutes. Right. This ship isn't like those strata rockets you've been testing. She's the first one built for outer space. If she works, she can go clear to the moon. If I'd have known that, I'd have brought my toothbrush. Well, not this trip. Now, get this, Steve. You've got power there to clear the Earth's gravitational field. But remember, after you cut in the rockets, you've only got ten minutes fuel. If you go beyond the outer limit and don't save fuel for the return... I know, I won't get down again. That's right, Steve. You'll drift off into space. Get that now. Ten minutes fuel. Gotcha. Now, as far as I'm concerned, this project is a lot more important than that cosmic ray bomb they're testing out in the Pacific tonight. Well, the Security Commission brass doesn't think so. I don't see any undersecretaries under anything. Don't worry. In the long run, our ship will make the CR bomb back page stuff. But in the meantime, it's just as dangerous. Remember, half the principles in this ship are pure theory, Steve. Slide rule stuff. If anything goes wrong, we may have to scrape you off the landscape with a soup spoon. You have a charming sense of humor. Well, here's what I'm getting at. We're risking your neck in this test. If anything blows, we don't want to have the next man pull the same boner. I know, Hank. So keep your mic open and keep talking. If anything goes wrong, we want to know exactly why. And we won't be able to ask you. Let us know before you pull every switch... Before you do anything. You got that? Yeah. Even if you only have to blow your nose. All right, get those fuel lines away. Okay, Mr. Grove. Well, I guess that's about all, Steve. Yeah, that reminds me. Look, if Mary calls, I'm just up on a milk run. I didn't tell her today was it. How is she? She's okay, but she's due about now, and I don't want her to be nervous. Hey, I didn't know the baby was that close. Yeah. Steve, I, I really ought to be sending a single man on this job. What, and cut me out of a soft paycheck? Forget it, Hank. You know, you can't get anybody else who can take 15 G's acceleration when those rockets cut in. Yeah, I know. It's time, Steve. Yeah. Well, see you later. Don't worry, Hank. I'll sweat for both of us. Button her up, Charlie. So long, Hank. So long. We'll give you the light from control. Okay, Steve.
Steve. Got you on the speaker. I'm ready to go. Mr. Hanson. Ready on radar, Sergeant? Check. Mr. Hanson, you better see this. What is it, Elsa? Message sent it for Steve. Mrs. Weston just left for the hospital. What? Hello, Steve. Yeah. Stand by a minute. Shall we hold the takeoff, Mr. Hanson? What? Oh, yes. Uh, no, wait, wait just a minute. It's, uh, it's too late now. You going to tell him? Maybe he's got enough to worry about. Hey, what's holding us up, Hank? Something in your mind? No, no, it's, uh, it's nothing, Steve. I just wanted to say good luck. Clear for takeoff, Charlie? Right. Okay, give him the light. Steve, I'm reading you clear. Uh, 20,000. Airspeed 600. She's running fine. Soundproofing works. There's a third degree waiver in the AGY pressure. Got that, Charlie? Check. Uh, dead center on radar, Mr. Hanson. 50,000 now. Cutting out the port jet. Now the starboard. Off jets. Airspeed dropping. Opening the rocket ports. Switch sticks a little, Charlie. Oxy alcohol, pressure is 350. All right, now I'm advancing the ignition key. Here goes rocket one. Steve. Steve, you all right? Yeah. Looks like somebody slugged me with a sledgehammer. Airspeed now, 1200. Here goes number two. Still climbing. Altitude, 297 miles. All right, you're at the outer limit. Level off for maneuver test. You've got exactly six minutes fuel left. Okay. Starting a three-degree left bank. It's a little sluggish. That's all right now. There's a low vibration someplace. Maybe the cockpit hatch. Now I'm straightening out. Five minutes fuel left. Now I'm starting a three-degree... Hey! Something up here. Something shining. What are you talking about? There's something above me, Hank. I'm going to chase it. Steve, Steve, you're at the outer limit now. I can see it plain now. Steve, don't go any higher. You've only got four minutes left. You've only got. It's getting static. I can't hear you, Hank. It's dead ahead now. I'm going to make a pass at it. Get a good look. Hey, it's swerving to meet me. It's dead ahead now. It's dead ahead. Steve. Steve, come in. Nine minutes fuel gone. Still no sign on radar. Hello, hello, Steve. Steve, what's happened? Charlie, get out the crash squad. Tell the Army squadron to alert their search planes. Right. Nine and a half minutes crash gone. Squadron. Hello. Hello, Steve. Steve. What's happened? Who oh, the devil is Charlie it? Hello. Mr. Hanson. Come in, Steve. We need a search squad. Come in. No, Mr. Hanson's busy. Hello. Hello, Steve. Hello, Steve. Ten minutes, Mr. Hanson. At the end of the fuel. How long has it been now? Ten hours, Mr. Hanson. Nothing more on radar, Sergeant? Screen's blank. Yeah. Colonel Corelli called in. Search planes are back. He didn't find anything. Should be some trace. He couldn't have bailed out, could he? You don't hit the silk at 4,400 miles an hour. He even went past the outer limit, ran out of fuel. Something blew and they'll find the pieces scattered from here to the coast. Why does it have to be the best man? Always the best man. I can't get it, sir. Charlie, yeah, Charlie, we've, you know, we've got to That's figure me. out what was wrong. Yes. All right, I'll tell him. Something, something right. must have blown. Yeah. There's a message from Northside Hospital for, for Steve. Well, what is it? Mrs. Weston's fine. A boy. Thank you, Elsie. It's a boy, Charlie. Oh. Fine. Fine. It's a boy. He didn't even know she went to the hospital. How am I going to tell Mary that? It wasn't your fault, Mr. Hanson. 
ship had to be tested. Yeah, yeah, we'll build another one, and some other flying fool will shoot past the outer limit into space. Oh, I'm getting old, Charlie. You can remember when I used to take him up myself. Now I've got to send other men. It's a job, Mr. Hanson. Now I'm afraid. Every time I hear a jet go off, I jump. Every time I have to send someone up in a new model, I start to sweat. Mr. Hanson. Yeah? I think there's something on the radar. No flight scheduled in, are there, Elsie? We have a whole day cleared. It's coming in behind us. Sure, it comes over the building. What crazy jockey is buzzing the field like that? Is that an army plane, Charlie? I can't see. It's turning. Charlie, alert the field. I know that engine. Steve! That's impossible. Look, there's this ship. It can't be. Well, there's no other model like that. It's Steve, all right. It's coming in. Thank God. Thank God. <laughs> Done, the quicker you get over to see Mary and the baby. Thanks. Elsie, give the order to check and refuel the rockets. I don't want anybody in here till I get Steve's reports. Bury any calls. All right, let's have it. What the devil happened to you? Hank, does that cosmic ray bomb still go off tonight? What are you talking about? Straighten out, Steve. Where you been for the last ten hours? Listen, Hank, there's something more important. Come on, come on. I've got to get a report on the screen to Washington, so let's have it. I've got to know how you stretch ten minutes fuel to keep you in the air for ten hours. Now, one thing before I talk. Look, Steve. Have the Geiger men run over the ship before they refuel. What'd you run into? So help me, Hank, I don't know. But we better check and make sure it isn't radioactive. Elsie, add a Geiger report on the standard check. Steve, maybe we better have the doc look you over, too. No, no, I'll be all right. They said I'd be all right. They? Look, son, I know you've had a tough time, but we've had this field on the alert for ten hours. One of the Army boys cracked up looking for you, and he's hurt bad. So let's have the story. Let's have it straight. I don't know how to tell you. Hank, I saw something up there. At 300 miles? I chased something up there, Hank, and I caught now it. Now don't hand me that, Listen, Steve. I was cruising along, just starting the right bank, when I spotted something. It must have been going about half my speed. It was egg-shaped and smooth. I made a pass at it, and I was coming back for another, and then there was a humming sound. Humming? A sort of vibration, and I blacked out. I was headed straight for it at 4,400 miles an hour. I thought it was going to be the biggest smash since Hiroshima, and... I guess I were drinking that bottle. Never mind that, Steve. What happened? I came to inside their ship. Uh-huh. Steve, this whole thing has been a devil of a strain on you. I'm going to call Major Donaldson from the Army base. Ask him to sit in. A psychiatrist? Yeah, yeah, that's a good idea. Let him run his tests. He'll tell you I'm not kidding. Because, Hank, unless I miss my guess, I've just been tipped off to the way the world ends. All right, Mr. Weston, suppose you continue your story. Yes, let's have it, Steve. You woke up inside the ship? Yes, and uh, the place was jammed with machinery. Hmm. Dials, blinkers... I couldn't recognize anything. And you were surrounded by these men from Mars? I didn't say anything about men from Mars. I didn't even say they were men. I couldn't see them clearly. They were just there. Where did they come from, then? Another galaxy. Millions of miles outside of our solar system. That's all I know. You figure out where they came from. And they came all that distance to find the Earth? Yes. Did they tell you that? Yes. You mean they spoke English to you? No, no, they didn't. It's funny. I hadn't thought. They didn't really speak to me at all. They just planted the thoughts in my mind. You mean thought transference, telepathy? Yes, that's right. Well, Steve, what brought them here? We did, Hank. We rang their bell. We brought them in. Well, how? With our atomic explosions. Hank, that's why you've got to stop that bomb test tonight. Uh, I'll give up. Look, you've got to believe me, Hank. Oh, how can I make you understand? Maybe I can help, Mr. West. Would you submit to narco-psychometry? What's that? Under proper drugs, I can put you back in this, uh, ship. By suggestion. Then we can get a playback record of your memory pattern on the audio circuit. How long will that take? Half an hour. We'll have to go over to the lab. 
Will you believe me if it checks? It will give us an accurate memory picture of what your mind reports. All right, let's go. Hank, you got to believe me. We haven't got much time. You should be getting drowsy now. Count backwards from ten. Attach the head plate electrode. The cortical pickup. Look out for that wire, Mr. Henson. Rio setting. 31.3. Now throw that switch, Mr. Henson. I have to start him off by suggestion. All right, Steve. You're in your ship now. You're in the rocket. Rocket. You're in the rocket. You're in the rocket. And you've just sighted something strange. Now I'm starting at three degree right. What's that? Hey, there's something up here. Something shining. His memory pattern. We're picking it up electronically. There's something above me, Hank. I'm going to chase it. It's piped through the audio circuits. I'm getting static. I can't hear you, Hank. This is where we lost contact with him. I'm going to make a pass at it. And... Hey, it's swerving to meet me. It's not ahead now. It's not ahead. No one. This is where he blacked out. There's no telling how long, minutes or hours. What's that noise? I don't know, quiet. Where? How did I get in here? What? Who are you? Is he seeing things? Intergalactic patrol. What's that? What are they saying, Steve? What are they saying? It's about nuclear fission. They know about it. They know the danger of it. Long ago, they had wars that almost destroyed them. But finally, they learned. Now they've outlawed war. Go on, Steve. They patrol space. When their detector picks up an atomic explosion, they send a patrol. What are they going to do? They've quarantined us. Quarantined? They've isolated the Earth. Because we don't know how to control ourselves yet. And until we learn will be a menace to the whole universe. What is this nonsense? Quiet. How are they going to do it, Steve? They've spread a layer out here of... I don't know how to call it. All around the Earth. It's miles deep. When there's an atomic explosion on Earth, the radioactive particles will drift up to this layer and set off a chain reaction. It'll go around the world in microseconds. And that's the end. The end? What's he... Wait, wait. wait. Yes. Yes. I understand. I've got to bring back the warning. You're going to put me back in my ship to bring the warning. Now what? Blacked out again. I guess that's all. What does all that mean? It's what he remembers. You don't think that really happened? No, no. Narcosychometry circuits produce what he remembers. It just means that Steve believes this happened. I don't uh, like to see this. Uh, I've seen too many top uh, pilots snap. Steve is the best I've known. <laughs> How bad do you think he is? Frankly, outside of the presence of this well-organized this hallucination, there's no sign of unbalance. It may not be too serious. If he had a more plausible story, I'd be inclined to believe Warning. him. Warning. Hank. It's all right, boy. Did you hear it, Hank? You understand? Sure, sure. We've, we've been quarantined. Now let me give you something to make you sleep, Steve. Don't you understand? They fixed it so that if we set off one more nuclear explosion, that'll be it. Of course. Don't roll your sleep down. You don't believe me. Now, take it easy, Steve. But the test tonight. They're setting off the CR bomb. Hank, what time is it? 11.20. Well, it's scheduled for midnight. Hank, we've got to stop that bomb. Steve, let Donaldson give you the hypo. Hank, you've got to believe me. I saw them. I got the warning. If we touch off that bomb tonight, it'll be the biggest galactic 4th of July of all time. The whole Earth will go up like a Roman candle. 
April 10th, 1965, the end. Now, look, Steve, you better calm down. Don't you want to see Mary and the baby? You've got a new son, remember? Yeah, that's just it. I, I want to see my son. I want him to live. If that bomb goes off, I think we've got to stop them. Mr. Hanson, I think we'd better get over to the base hospital. Hank, you've got to believe yeah, me. Yeah, sure, sure, Steve. Maybe there is something to it. Look, it's out of your hands. I'll put it in a report and shove it into Washington in the morning. In the morning? There isn't going to be any morning, Hank. Don't you understand? You've got to call Washington now. Get the head of the security commission and postpone that test. Now, you know I can't do that, Steve. My neck would be out a mile. Besides, this is 1965, not 45. Twenty countries have atomic bombs now. What's the use of stopping just this one? The rest will keep right on popping them. Well, then we'll have to call an international conference. Can't you understand, Hank? The first one that goes off finishes us at the end. They've given us the quarantine warning. Steve, I think you'd better go with us to the base hospital. Look, Steve. We can call up for a detail if we have to. All right, all right. I'll go with you. You don't need a straight jacket. That's the way, Steve. You'll probably feel better by morning. Let's go. Well, Steve, tomorrow I'll drive you over to the hospital to see Mary and the kid. Sure. Look at the ship under the floodlights. Pretty, huh? You'll be flying her again soon, don't you worry. Yeah, yeah, I guess so. Uh, what you doing out in the line? The, uh, refueler? Yeah, we got Clausewitz coming in tomorrow from Denver for another test. Figure we give you a day off. That's good. That's fine. Steve! Steve, come back! Come on, Donald. Steve! Steve, wait! He's heading for the rockets. Look, there he goes up. That crazy fool. We can't get at him now. That covers armor glass. He's waving. Now, towards control. It's the radio. He needs the radio. Come on. I should have gotten help. Now the radio still hooked up here. Hello. Hello, Steve. Listen to me, Hank. You gotta call Washington now. Come out of that rocket, Steve. I'll call my men. Don't Hank. try anything, Hank. They refueled the rocket for tomorrow. Take it easy, Steve. Listen, you know what'll happen when I fire the rocket tubes down here? Steve, don't. It'll burn out every building for five miles. All of us in one big blast. Steve, what do you want? You've got to stop that bomb. you got to call Washington right now. They won't believe me. You make that call or I cut in the rocket. Now, I mean it, Hank. Now, hook my screen to yours in parallel. I want to see exactly what you're doing. All right, all right. Just don't fire those rockets. Get going, Hank. you got 12 minutes to make that call and stop that bomb. All right, I'm making the parallel hookup right now. Donaldson, you think he'll really blast? I don't know. Up to now, I'd almost say it was normal, but now he's liable to do anything, Hanson. Steve... Steve, there, are you getting it on your screen? Yeah. Now put that call through. All right. Operator. Visit screen to Washington. The visit screen circuits are busy, sir. If you'll try again in half an hour. This is security commission priority. Break in, get me a line. Yes, sir. Just a moment, please. Ten minutes, Hank. Listen, Steve, I'm trying. We're ready to take your call, sir. Uh, Washington, security commission three. This is urgent. I want undersecretary Herbert Ames. Washington three. One moment, please. Hurry, will you? One moment, please. What time is it, Donaldson? 11.51. Do you think he'll fire those rockets? He might. Washington? Visit screen three. Mr. Herbert Ames, please. That is a coded exchange. I cannot accept your call without clearance. Get it through, Hank! Listen, Washington, put it through. This is Mr. Hanson at San Marco Air Base. This is a priority call. I'm coded. One moment, please. I will check your code number. Get that through, Hank, and that bomb goes off at 12. Will you be reasonable, Steve? Huh? Your call has cleared, San Marco. Washington, visit screen three. Herbert Ames, please. Security Commission Ames. Listen, Ames. Hello, Hans. Ames, you've got to get me to the chief. Are you kidding? He's at the test control room. Yes, I know, but get him for me. What's up? You look lousy. Or is it a bad circuit? There's no time. I've got to get him before the test. It's about the CR bomb. I can't take that responsibility. Get that through, Hank. Right play. Hey, what's going on there? Ames, my project has a high enough rating. This is a priority A call. What? Well, okay, it's your neck. I'll try to get him for you. He's in the control room, so you'll have to switch off your screen and speaker and go on earphones. Too much going on in there. Security you hear that, Steve? I've got, uh, I've got to cut the incoming screen. All right, but don't try anything. Eight minutes, Hank. Hello? Hello? What? You got him, Hank? Yes. This, this is Hanson at San Marco. No, sir, priority A request to cancel the bomb test. No, no, I'm serious. This is deadly serious. We sent the X-2 JTR up today to the outer limit. We uncovered evidence. Yes, on the automatic instruments. What's that? No possible chain reaction. 
No, I, I can't tell you the whole story. There isn't time here. Yes, yes, I, I'll bring the readings into Washington in the morning. You've got to postpone the test till you see them. Look, I've worked on contracts with the commission for ten years. Yes, yes, I have complete confidence in my information. You can record that. All right, I, I'll call you back immediately. Bye. Hank? Hank? He's agreed to cancel, Steve. The bomb won't go off. All right, boy. You can come down out of that ship. He's opening up. Here he comes. All right, Steve. Come on down. Sure, Hank. Just a second. Hank, I was scared. I was plain scared. Easy now. It's all over. The bomb won't go off. Thank God. Now look, uh, I want to see Mary and the baby. Can you get me transportation now? Oh, wait a minute. It's almost 12. They won't let you in the hospital now. I want to see the baby. Sure you do, but you've been under a strain. I've got a shot for you here, Steve. Give you a good night's sleep. All right. Roll up your sleeve. Yeah, here. Sergeant will find you a bed. Yes, sir. Come on, Mr. Weston. Okay. Good night, Hank. I'm kind of beat. It's been a tough night. It sure has. I thought for a minute he was going to blast those rockets and send us all to Kingdom Come. Yeah. Quite a stunt getting the ray bomb test called off. It isn't called off. But the chief said... Ames couldn't get the chief. I was talking to a dead circuit. Bomb goes off in a couple of minutes. Oh. Poor Steve. He was one of the best. He was the best. One in ten million. Some story of this poor guy. For a while, he almost had me believing in that quarantine. That's a very common illusion. End of the world. Yeah. I suppose so. Ah, it's a nice night. Never saw the stars so bright. We better be getting in. That wind is cold. Huh? Well, the bomb goes off in 30 seconds. Poor Steve. You know, Hanson, there's just one thing. Yeah? It's outside my field, but I'm curious. How did he keep that ship in the air for 10 hours with only 10 minutes fuel? You have just heard another adventure in time, space, and the unknown world of the future. The world of... Dimension... A star of the future appearing on the program of the future, Dimension X. Next week, Miss Nancy Olson, the talented young actress whose performance in Sunset Boulevard marks her as one of Hollywood's most promising young actresses, becomes the first of a group of rising young artists of stage and screen who have been invited to make an appearance in this series. So listen then for Hello Tomorrow, starring Nancy Olson on Dimension X. Tonight, Dimension X has transcribed The Outer Limits, written by Graham Dorr and adapted for radio by Ernest Canoy. Featured in the cast were Wendell Holmes as Hanson, Joseph Julian as Steve, and Joe DeSantis as Donaldson. Your host was Norman Rose. Music by Albert Berman, engineer Bill Chambers. Dimension X is produced by Van Woodward and directed by Edward King.
exciting news for adventure seekers. Join us on a thrilling journey through the vibrant landscapes and diverse culture of Brazil. Lost in Brazil brings you to captivating videos showcasing heart-pounding adventures, mouth-watering cuisine, and hidden gems of this incredible country. From bustling cities to tranquil beaches, our videos capture the essence of Brazil's beauty, experience the warmth of its people, the rhythm of its music, and the thrill of exploration. Click on the link in the description to find out more. The National Broadcasting Company delays the start of this program to bring you a special news bulletin. From the NBC Newsroom in New York, United Nations troops have begun a breakthrough from their beachhead in South Korea, launching an attack from positions north of Taegu for a drive toward Seoul. The new offensive is timed with a big amphibious assault at Incheon, which is progressing on schedule. Keep tuned to your NBC station for the later news. Space. Transcribed in future tense. Dimension X, 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 X. Tonight, a story of the future and a star of the future. The story, Hello Tomorrow, and the star, Miss Nancy Olson. The talented young actress who is currently winning critical acclaim for her performance in one of the outstanding pictures of the year, Sunset Boulevard. Tonight, Miss Olsen becomes the first of a group of the stage and screen's most promising young stars of tomorrow to be invited to appear on the program of tomorrow, Dimension X. It was in the year 1991 that man disappeared from the face of the earth. The third atomic war had ended at last, leaving the land a mass of red radioactive dust, filling the air with gamma rays so deadly that life on the surface was no longer possible. There was only one way out. The few survivors went underground, burrowing their way deep into the earth like hunted moles, hiding from death in huge underground caverns. And it was there in the next 2,000 years that they built the new civilization, a civilization in which the genetic survival of the race came first, and every life and every law was shaped to serve that end. It is to this civilization, in the year of our Lord, 4,195 A.D., that we take you now. Yes? I have a call from the Director of Emotional Stability for the Third Oblong for Professor Lois Burton at the Institute of Genetics. This is Professor Burton. One moment. Go ahead, sir. Lois? Listen, darling, good news. What? The Genetic Board has approved our application for marriage. Oh, so soon? The tests filed our chromosomes perfect. We can marry any time we want. Our offspring should be genetically in the 19th percentile of perfection. What's the matter, dear? Oh, nothing. I, I'm just sort of breathless. You are happy about it, aren't you, darling? Oh, of course. Terribly happy. I'm coming right over to the lab. I have a surprise. Oh, not now, Walter. What? Well, I mean you'll have to give me some time. Time? What's the trouble? No trouble. It's that genetic survey I've been working on. What about it? Well, I've finally gotten permission to study an actual living case. A specimen of imperfect genetic transmission. Really? Yes, they're bringing him up from the condemned cages on the lower level. You will be careful, darling. The supervisor says there's nothing to be afraid of. The specimen they're bringing is, uh, XJ-12. It's been studied before many times and is quite well trained. Well, I don't like it. Nonsense, darling. I've been waiting for this opportunity for years. Oh, there's my door signal. I'll have to hang up, darling. See you later. Yes? Professor Lois Burton? Yes? I'm from the Philogenic Institute. Lower level. Oh, uh, then you brought me specimen XJ-12. May I come in? By all means. Oh, how? Horrible. It all depends on your viewpoint. I happen to have a twisted leg. My parents were genetically unsound. Then you... Yes. 
I am specimen XJ-12. I see. I hope you aren't shocked. N no stable person permits feelings to enter into his work. I will admit to surprise. I was expecting something a little more, uh, abnormal. Sorry, I try to be as abnormal as possible. If I am, the Philogenic Institute allows me out of the genetic cages every so often, so I can breathe the pure air of the upper levels and mingle with the genetically perfect. You seem quite well educated. I spent the first years of my life here in the upper levels. How was that possible? They segregate imperfects. As a small child, my mother concealed me from the director of selective heredity. I was brought up in secret. My mother actually, dreadful word, loved me. I see. That would explain your obviously low threshold of emotional control. If you choose to call it that. At first, you uh, seemed to be struggling to repress a few feelings yourself. We will confine ourselves to the impersonal aspects of our work. As you please. I shall require you as a demonstration for a lecture I'm delivering to one of my classes tomorrow. At your service, Professor. Sit here, please. Grip these electrodes tightly. I'm going to calibrate your electrochemical tension. I'm quite familiar with the procedure. Oh! I realize that as an imperfect, I'm expendable. But I should hate to be electrocuted. The charge is not lethal. Plus 15 surface tension. You know, you have beautiful hair. Uh, <clears throat> plus 12 at a depth of 4 centimeters. Lovely blue eyes. Crystal clear. <clears throat> plus 10 at 7 centimeters. Pretty. A perfect woman. Lovely, expressive hands. And a heart of stone. Like all the rest of you perfect survival types. Try not to jump, sir, when the current strikes. No feelings under control passed by the director of emotional stability. Shut up! <sighs> Maybe I was wrong. Maybe you... you have feelings. That will be quite enough. I seem to sense an air of emotional tension. Nothing, dear. This is a specimen XJ-12. Oh, I see. An inferior type. Quite. You, specimen. Can you understand me? Yes. Yes what? Tell this dolt who I am, Lois. This is a director of emotional stability for the third oblong. He also happens to be my selected genetic partner. You will address him as sir. Yes, sir. This creature seems quite impertinent. He's only a specimen, darling. I suppose. We'll use him and ship him back to the cages at the Institute. He's probably radioactive. You, specimen. Mr. Director. You will confine your speech to answering only those questions addressed to you. Understand? Yes, sir. Perfectly. <laughs> The next demonstration will be conducted by Professor Lois Burton of the Institute of Genetics. Her topic, the probability of radioactive damage in the chromosome heredity of imperfect non-survival types. Professor Burton. We are very fortunate today in having obtained a specimen of an imperfect genetic type through the good graces of the Philogenic Institute. Moreover, this specimen has been trained to tell in his own words about the factors in his upbringing. Specimen XJ-12. Thank you. My mother was a psychotechnician in the fifth oblong. My father was a historian specializing in the records of pre-atomic surface culture. In the earthquake of 2170, Apparently, some hard radiation filtered down through the tunnels and penetrated the fifth oblong. The effect on my hereditary factors is quite apparent in this twisted leg. <laughs> I appreciate that you do not laugh. Most audiences seem compelled to laugh. Perhaps you are different. If so, perhaps you can be made to understand somehow what it means to be labeled an imperfect. 
Perhaps in some way I can penetrate the insulation with which the psychotechnicians, the drugs, and the glandular experts have surrounded your emotions. Wait. As director of emotional stability for this oblong, I order you to confine yourself to the subject. My father taught me in the last days before he was executed that every human personality is born with certain inalienable natural rights. The right of free expression, the right to have feelings, and the right to mature, and above all, the right to be different from every other living organism, because every organism is different. I submit to you, distinguished students, that the attempt by this society to abridge these rights is a violation of nature. I say that the imperfects, the mutants, those who are different have as much right to exist and be free as you. I say break open the cages, free my people. Stop him. Give us back the right to be individuals. Stop him. I say... Ah! Uh. Professor Burton, take this specimen back to your laboratory and confine him. Yes, Mr. Director. You, specimen, go quietly, I warn you. I have nothing but contempt for your warnings. I'll have you destroyed for this. The specimen is unstable. He doesn't know what he's saying. Then get him out of here, quickly. He's an affront to our genetic type. Oh. Hold still while I bandage your head. Uh, oh. He'll be all right. I, I suppose you detest me for getting you into trouble. Don't squirm. Not that I blame you. I don't detest you. Oh. oh. In fact, I thought you quite magnificent. You what? As you spoke, something began to stir in me. You don't hate me. I've never felt so strange. Tell me what you feel. If I moved you, then I must have moved the others, some of them at least. I don't know quite how to explain it, a, a strange sympathy. Compassion. For some reason, I took pride in what you were doing, seeing you stand up against them. Why do you look at me like that? Because I can't help it. I wish you wouldn't. You're only an imperfect, you know. You have no rights. Please, XJ-12. My name is Oren. Please. Say it. Oren. Oren? Again. Oren. Lois. Oren. Lois, Lois, Lois. What is it? Why do I feel this way? In the cages, they call it love. Love? We have no such concept in the upper level. You've destroyed it. Would it be correct to say, I feel feel love for you? It would be correct. I feel love for you. Darling, darling. Lois, what about Walter? You're going to marry him? No. You're genetically suited to each other. I don't care. I won't marry him. There must be some other way. But... <gasps> Walter! Very touching. Very tender. Walter, how could you spy? In my capacity as director of emotional stability, it is my duty to spy. Specimen XJ-12 will be disposed of quite systematically by the state. For the good of the state. For the good of the genetic code. And in the name of emotional stability. Come in, Lois. I wondered how long it would be before you came to my office. Walter, I have to talk to you. Go right ahead. Walter, you mustn't destroy him. Send him back to the cages, but don't kill him. You speak of destroying an inferior creature as if it was something unethical. Walter, Walter, please, for my sake. Lois, I understand that you've entered a plea for postponement of our marriage at the Records Bureau. Yes, I... I was too upset to go through with it. It came as a great disappointment to me. If you were married to me, you would be safe from influences such as this XJ-12. In which case, I might even be persuaded to send him back to the cages. Instead of having him... destroyed. You see? Yes. I see. 
Think it over. Well, my dear? When can we be married? Soon. Tomorrow, if you like. The sooner the better. Lois. Lois, you make me very... What about XJ-12? Oh, I see. A bargain is a bargain. Let me talk to the custodian, please. Hello. This is the director of emotional stability for the third oblong. I would like you to cancel the execution of specimen XJ-12. Yes. Yes, that's right. Turn him over to the security guard. He's to be remanded permanently to the genetic cages. Let me talk to him, Walter. My dear, I don't think Please, that... I, I want to be sure he's all right. Very well. Hello. Connect a circuit in the cell block. I want to talk to XJ-12. Here you are, my dear. Hello? Oren? Yes. No, I I'm all right. How, how are you? Fine. Oren, I... I've been talking to Walter. He's going to send you back to the cages. Yes. Yes. No. No, I, I'm going to marry him. Because I... I want to. I'm not lying to you. I... I'm very happy. Yes. Yes, I, I've got to hang up now. Goodbye. Goodbye. And now, Lois. Walter, please, I... I've got to get back to the lab. Of course. I'll pick you up in, say, an hour, and we'll make plans for the wedding. All right? Yes. Yes, of course. Goodbye, Walter. <sighs> Hello. This is the director of emotional stability again. I want you to cancel that last order. Proceed with the execution, but under conditions of absolute secrecy. No. Don't use the lethal chamber. Take him to the tunnels on the upper level. That's correct. Fine. This way. Where are you taking me? You're being returned to the Philogenic Institute. Orders from the Director of Emotional Stability. Into the elevator. Very well. Why are we going toward the surface? The cages are on the lower levels. Radiation check. They've never done that before. New procedure. All right. Walk. Hawk, state your business. I'm the custodian for the third oblong. This imperfect is my prisoner. You can't go beyond this checkpoint. There's radioactivity in the tunnels. This is a special mission, if you know what I mean. Oh, I see. Well, just a moment, I'll open the airlock. Go ahead. You'll find two radiation suits in the chamber. Uh, we will need only one. So this is how they get rid of imperfects. March inside. All right. Turn around. Suppose I refuse. It'll be less painful if you cooperate. Before you dispose of me, could I give you a message for a friend? That depends. What is the message? This! <laughs> Security! Help! Security! What is it? What happened? The prisoner, he struck me. Before I could recover, he escaped into the tunnels. Well, he won't last long. If the radiation doesn't get him, he'll starve to death. Can you go after him? I could send a robot, but it isn't worth the trouble. There's no way back from the tunnels except through here. Only other direction he can go is toward the surface. The closer he gets, the hotter the radiation. No, I think you can consider your prisoner dead.
wine, my dear? No, thank you, Walter. You look very beautiful, my dear. Very beautiful. Thank you. These hydroponic fruits are delicious, aren't they? Oh, uh, the wedding will just be a small affair. I've arranged for a few friends. The director of endocrine control, the chief of the security guards, one or two assistants to high council members. Walter, did... Yes? Was he returned to the cages? Now, why must you spoil this lovely dinner by bringing that up? Was he, Walter? Well... Was he? Well, as a matter of fact, there was a little difficulty. Difficulty? Yes. You see, he escaped. Escaped? He struck a guard and ran off into the tunnels. The tunnels? But that's death. He's free to return any time he chooses. When did it happen? Just a few hours ago, as a matter of fact. Walter... Now, don't, don't become upset again, darling. You planned it, didn't you, Walter? Stability, darling. Stability. 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 Is that all I'm to hear from you for the rest of my life? Darling. Here's what I think of stability. Well, we're not to be married. I'd be compelled to turn you over to the endocrine surgeons for doing that. Well, you can go right ahead. Because we aren't going to be married. Checkpoint. This is the director of emotional security. Yes, sir. If Professor Burton tries to pass the checkpoint, I want to take it into custody. Well, Professor Burton just passed, sir. She said You that... idiot. But she said I don't that care we... what she said. Stop her. Send robots after her. Get her back. I'll have you destroyed as incompetent if you fail. Yes, sir, at once, sir. Robot control. Checkpoint to robot control. Order out all televocal robots into the tunnels. Have them bring back any humans. This is a first priority order. Why did you come here? It's suicide. I had to. Darling, are you all right? So far. You've got to turn back. Give yourself up. They'll kill me. You can't stay here. The radiation is plus four at this point. It gets worse as you approach the surface. Go back, darling. What will you do? I'm going ahead. But you can't. I can. I'm going to the surface. Not even the robots can, can, can survive it. At least I'll be the first human in 1,100 years to see what the surface of the Earth looks like. Come back with me. No, darling. Then I'm going with you. Lois. Don't try to stop me, darling. There's nothing to go back to now. Nothing but Walter and emotional stability. Lois, you... You really want to come with me? Yes. You know what it means. I don't care. Oh, darling, I can't let you go. Oren, I... I love you. See, I... I know how to say it now. So say it again. Oren, I love you. Lois. Lois, what's that? It sounds... Oh, Oren, it's the robot control. It's looking for us. Come on, we've got to hurry. This way, hurry! Oh, and wait! Didn't get you much further, darling. The robot is gaining. Here, here, let me help you. I can't, I just can't. All right, darling, we'll stop here. We may as well wait for it. Oh, all right. Coming, I, I can see it's light now. Darling, listen. It stopped. The lights are swinging around. Or and it sees us. Come on, darling. One last effort. Come on, run. Look. Look ahead. You can see the lights reflecting from something. It looks like a door. It is. No, it's, it's, it's a heavy lead door. There's a lever. Hurry. Come on through. Lois, there must be some way to close it. Here. Let me help you. It won't get through that. It's solid lead. Oren, where are we? I... 
I don't know. Look, up there, a huge round light. Lois. Yes, Arn. That's, that's Luna. The moon. We're on the surface. How red everything looks. How it glows. It's the radioactivity. Quiet, peaceful, deadly. Oh, darling. Sit here and rest a while. Put your arm around me. Oren, I'm afraid. Oren, we're going to die. Don't think about it. Just think about us alone. The first humans to stand on the surface of Earth in 2,000 years. Lois, that door must have been placed there by the last handful of survivors who went underground after the atomic wars. Those other lights, the small ones, they must be stars. Oh, and I, I'm so tired. Go to sleep, darling. Put your head on my shoulder and sleep. Hold me, Oren. Hold me very close. Oren. Uh, Oren, wake up. What is it? Look, it's light. What? The whole universe is light. Oh, Oren, how beautiful. Look. By all the laws of nature, we should be dead. Lois, no life could survive this. By all the laws of nature, Oren. What is it? We're not dead. This is Earth and we're alive. We're not going to die. But the radiation, it's present. You, you can see its effects. Oren, did you ever hear of adaptation? Of what? There is a natural law of adaptation by which an organism will try to adjust itself to its environment by changing. It's called a geotropism. I don't see what that has to do with... All these generations, we've been bombarded by radiation filtering down through the Earth. Each successive generation must have inherited some degree of immunity to the effects of radiation. And you think that... Oh, and it can't hurt us. Don't you see? We're immune. We are probably the first generation to inherit sufficient immunity. But if that's true, then then we can transmit that immunity. We can pass it along to our children. Come on, darling. We'll have to find food and water. <laughs> the practical wife. Oh, wait a minute, darling. What are you doing with that rock? I want to scratch something on the outside of this lead door. Lois and Oren. Forty, one, ninety-five, A.D. Hello, tomorrow. Tonight, Dimension X, the program of the future, has introduced a new star of the future, Miss Nancy Olson. Miss Olsen appeared by courtesy of Paramount Pictures and may currently be seen in their production, Sunset Boulevard. Next week on Dimension X, the strange and sinister story of Dr. Grimshaw's sanitarium. Tonight, Dimension X has transcribed Hello Tomorrow, written by George Lefferts, appearing with Nancy Olsen with Santos Otega as Walter and Donald Buca as Oren. Your narrator was Norman Rose. Music by Albert Berman. Engineer Bill Chambers. Dimension X is produced by Van Woodward and directed by Edward King. Enjoy Bob Hope and Baby Snooks when they return this fall on NBC. Adventures in time and space told in future tense. What you will hear transcribed in the next half hour represents either a magnificent hoax or the true explanation of the famous Grimshaw Sanatorium scandal which made the headlines back in 1947. 
The manuscript upon which this account is based was removed by the New York State Police from a fountain pen cover found in the doorway to Dr. Grimshaw's study. We offer this manuscript as evidence only. Whether it is authentic or not, you must judge for yourself. My name is John Doherty. Hamilton College, class of 34, member of Theta Alpha. I'm one of those fools who wanted some excitement in life. So instead of going into my father's shoe business, I became a private detective. These are facts. You can check them if you like. The rest of what I write here is so fantastic that I don't expect it to be believed. If anyone should find this manuscript and read it, all I ask is that you notify Miss Millicent Armbruster of 299 Wallace Avenue, Buffalo, that Johnny Doherty is dead. On the evening of July 1st, Miss Armbruster and I were driving to a wedding. Not our own, though I wish it had been. It was Sunday, and in order to avoid traffic, I took the old mill road, single-lane dirt affair that runs past the Gowanda Cemetery. Hey, Johnny, aren't you going too fast? Uh -huh, not for this road. There isn't a thing around except some tombstone. Johnny, there's a gate to the cemetery. What about? That hurts. I don't see any... Hey, Johnny, look out. Look out. <laughs> It was a big black hearse with no lights on, pulling out of the cemetery. Lucky I had good brakes. We skidded for about 20 feet and slammed into the back of the hearse. The two rear doors buckled and snapped open. It was a freak. A huge oak coffin with brass handles tipped up and began to slowly to slide back toward us. Oh, Johnny, look. The coffin is sliding out. Holy Oh, horrible. You, you stay right here, honey. I, I'll help the driver with that thing. Hey, you okayed in the speed limits, do you, Jack? Now, look, let's not get hung up on who was right and who was wrong. I was going too fast, and you were traveling without lights after dark. Main thing is, nobody's hurt and no damage done, except for that coffin. And I don't suppose the occupant minds too much. Let's see the driver's license and registration. Right here. Hmm. John Doherty. Oh, a private eye, huh? You listen to the radio too much, Junior. Now, if you don't mind, who does this joy wagon belong to? Rwanda Funeral Service. It's being rented to Grimshaw. Who? Grimshaw from the private sanatorium. Do you mind if I ask what you were doing after dark coming out of a cemetery with a wooden kimono? We're moving one of Grimshaw's patients to a new grave. Uh-huh. Do they always travel like this? Now, look, Hawkshaw, how about skipping the third degree and giving me a hand getting the box back in the wagon, huh? The pleasure. Better screw on the cover again. It's going to slide off. Well, let's get it in the hearse first. Okay, Junior. You get on that end. You ready? Live. Just, just slide it, brother. Who's in there, King Kong? Look out for the cover. Hey. Uh, I told you that it happened. Hey, uh, uh, what's the guy's name, Junior? Why don't you ask him? Real wise guy, huh? I've got half a mind to report this accident. Yeah, go ahead. See what gets you. Grimshaw's got a lot of influence around here, mister. A lot of influence. Now, if you'll pardon me, I'll deliver the body. So long, Joe.
sometimes in my business, when things drop off, you have to go out and uh, dig up new clients. Well, my next case was a gentleman named Harlan Ward Sr., the wealthy automobile manufacturer. I had gotten his name off his son's tombstone. Are you trying to tell me, Dorothy, that my son Harlan was never buried at Kuanda Cemetery? Exactly, Mr. Ward. Why? Maybe if you'll tell me the circumstances surrounding your son's death, I can help answer that. My son was a rather impetuous young man. Tall, good-looking. After his graduation from Princeton, he began drinking quite heavily. After he got into a couple of scrapes, we sent him to Dr. Grimshaw's sanatorium in the hope that he could be cured. While my wife and I were in Europe, we received word that he had died. He was buried at Gowanda in our absence. Last week, my wife and I decided to have his body removed to the family vault here at Short Hills. How did your son die, Mr. Ward? Suicide. He slashed his wrists at the sanatorium. You never saw the body? No. We couldn't get back from Europe in time. I see. See here. How do I know this whole thing isn't a plan to fleece me? How do I know that you didn't remove the body yourself? You don't. But you're a rich man, Mr. Ward. And you're perfectly willing to take a chance that I'm on the level and that your son may still be alive. You sound very sure of yourself, Mr. Dorothy. My fee is $2,000 retainer plus expenses. What sort of expenses? However much it costs to take the cure at Dr. Grimshaw's sanatorium. What do you say, Mr. Ward? All right, Dorothy. My secretary will send you a check in the morning. Good. Oh, uh, one other thing. What's that? I want a photograph of your son, a good one. I think that can be arranged. Look here, Dorothy. If I cooperate, how do I know that you won't run off? I won't guarantee it. On the other hand, I might have to get myself killed on this job. We both take a risk, Mr. Ward. Dr. Grimshaw's sanatorium was just outside Gowanda, and it was strictly for the 400 at $60 a day. Most of the cases were nervous breakdowns and alcoholics. I committed myself as a dipso, and just to make it convincing, I stopped at five or six bars on the way over. I was interviewed by Grimshaw himself, a small man with a fringe of white hair. He seemed on the level. And yet, there was something just the slightest bit phony about the whole deal. You uh, understand, Mr. Doherty. Uh, that's not my real name, of course. Uh, social reasons. Mm. We understand. Our paid clientele is very select. Our rates are rather high. You'll be paid in cash and in advance, Dr. Grimshaw. You'll find us most sympathetic. Um, how long does a cure usually take, Doctor? Well, that, of course, depends on the degree of alcoholism. This is my assistant, Dr. Boy, now. How do you do? How do you do? We are accepting Mr. Doherty as a patient. You better place him in the ward with Mr. K and Mr. Crakey. Mr. K is a long-term patient, Mr. Doherty. Highly intelligent man, formerly a professor of plant pathology. Mr. Crakey suffers mild delusions. I think you'll find him rather amusing. After about three days, my roommates, Arthur K and Crakey, got used to me, and we even began to play three-handed bridge. K was a chronic dope addict, an intelligent, sensitive man. Crakey was nothing but a clown. He kept a big black cat named the Professor, which he talked to as if it were human. And so I said to her, my dear Countess, if you don't like the company of my cat, then you don't like me. She looked at me as if I were insane, but of course the joke was on her because I was. <laughs> a Professor? You will have to forgive Count Crakey, Mr. Doherty. When you've been here as long as I have, you'll get used to him. Do you like cats, Mr. Doherty? I do hope you like cats since we are to have adjoining rooms. The professor is very sociable and excellent company. Except when he kills birds and deposits them in your bed. He's nothing but a feline murderer as far as I'm concerned. Ah, uh, see, you have insulted him. <laughs> Come here, professor. Let's make friends. Uh, how about giving me your paw? <laughs> Hey, catch me, you black devil. You insulted him. You hurt his feelings. Well, keep him away from me. It will be a pleasure. I would advise you not to insult him again. Count Crakey is not altogether without influence here, as Mr. Cable inform you. Good afternoon. And evening. <laughs> is he always as nuts as that? Ever since I've been here. How did they let him keep that black Satan? I don't know. I suppose Grimshaw wants to pamper him. He's been here since they opened the place, I understand. Spends about three hours a day getting therapy from Grimshaw. What's his problem? Manic depressive. A little paranoid, too. Mm. 
How long have you been here, Arthur? At Grimshaw's, two years. I left for a while, but I couldn't stay away from the junk, so I committed myself again. Did you uh, happen to know a patient here named Harlan Ward? What do you ask that? Do you know him? No, I met, met him socially a few times. I uh, understand he died here. So the newspapers said I wouldn't know. Suicide, wasn't it? Was it? You're being pretty careful, aren't you? Mr. Tordy, what would you say if I were to tell you that I don't believe Harlan Ward is dead? What makes you so certain? Harlan Ward used to share this room with us. He slept in the same bed you now use. I see. He was an alcoholic. Doing quite well, too, from what I could observe. We all expected him to go home soon. Then one evening, he had a violent fight with Craigie. Craigie accused him of snooping or something. Later that night, Grimshaw and Voyner took him out. Where? They take all the special treatment cases to the charity clinic. It's that small building on the other side of the stone wall. I think they do their surgery cases there. Why did they take him there? I don't know. Confinement, I guess. A few days later, we read about his death. Suicide, they said. Why do you think he's still alive, Arthur? This. About a month ago, I was in the garden next to the wall that separates us from the charity clinic. Suddenly, I thought I heard a sound like a child whimpering. It stopped. A moment later, this note came over the wall wrapped around a stone. Then I'm certain I heard a blow and a scream again like a child. What does the note say? Help me, for God's sake, Harlan Ward. I haven't told anyone yet for fear Grimshaw and Pointer might find out. It might just be some insane prank by one of the charity cases. And yet, but why should Dr. Grimshaw want to pretend Harlan Ward is dead? I'm not an oracle, Mr. Doherty. What about this charity clinic? I've always been curious. Grimshaw and Voyner make sure that no patient goes there unsupervised. Many of those who've been taken across like Harlan Ward, I've never seen again. Arthur, how'd you like to have some fun? Like what? Like sneaking out tonight and going over the wall. What do you say? It'd break the monotony a little. I don't know. If there's something fishy going on, it'd be better to find out now, wouldn't it? I suppose there's no real harm in it. Of course not. I'd go alone, but I'll need help scaling that wall. Will you do it? All right. I'll go with you. It was shortly after midnight when Kay and I slipped out of the room and made our way out to the garden. Count Crakey was snoring soundly when we left. The wall was about eight feet high, but we made it without too much trouble. Hunt! All clear. Give me your hand and I'll lift you. <laughs> now, careful when you drop. Ready? Go ahead. There's a charity building over there. The one with the lights in the basement window. Come on. We'll make a run across the driveway and hide in that clump of bushes alongside the building. Ready? All right. Okay, hold it. Drop flat. What's the matter? Let's crawl over toward the window with the light. Maybe we can see something. I suppose you've got the shots. Listen. Take it easy. Sounds like Grimshaw. Much. Let's get closer. Can you make out what he's saying? No, I... And that... Good Lord, what was that? Probably some patient having the DTs. I think it came from that basement window. Let's get over there where I can have a look. Easy. What do I do to get caught now? Just... See anything? Easy and relax. It's some sort of That's laboratory. That's right. I can see Grimshaw, Zoyna, and someone else with its back toward me. If we're still, we may make out what they're saying. Take it quietly. It will be easier. No. I warn you. Please, please. It will all be over soon. No. You won't remember anything. No, I don't want to go. Boyner, give it to him. No, no, no. Shut him up, Boyner. No. Good Lord. What is it? Now, come on. We've got to get out of here. What did you see? What did they do to that child? Arthur, that wasn't a child. It was a midget. The smallest midget I've ever seen. What were they doing? Trying to give it some sort of injection. When it resisted, Boyna knocked it out. Well, what do you suppose they were doing to it? I don't know, Arthur. All I know is that when it fell, it had the face of Harlan Ward. A 
all the way back to our room. My brain was working like a pinball machine. Only the score wouldn't add up. up. The, the pieces were there all right. A crazy old doctor, a brutal assistant, a private sanatorium, and a, a midget with a dead man's face. But I couldn't figure it out. I thought that when I got back to our room, I'd have some time to think about it. But I'd forgotten about our friend, the happiness boy, Count Craigie. Ah! So I have caught you. Fine. So you've caught us. Now, how about crawling back into the woodwork like a good little count? Well, where are you? Mink hunting. Arthur and I like to go mink hunting at night. It's a funny thing, though. The mink weren't running very good. The grunion were running like crazy, though, weren't they, Arthur? Like crazy, Mr. Doherty. You make fun of Count Craigie. You're lying. I shall report you to Dr. Boyna. Better not, if you know what's good for you. So you threaten me. Me, Count Craigie. World champion gymnast and barbell balancer. I shall scream for help. Help! Help! Did you hurt him? Just knocked him out. What do we do now? Put him to bed. Hope that when he wakes up in the morning, he's forgotten the whole thing. And if he hasn't? They won't take him seriously anyway. I don't think Grimshaw would believe him. Besides which, he doesn't know what we actually were doing. Come on. Let's get him back into bed. I went to sleep in my own room. And the next thing I felt was the sharp jab of the hypodermic needle in my left arm. I started to struggle, but it was no use. Take it. Boyna and another assistant were holding me down. Grimshaw stood over me, the empty needle still in his hand. That's it. He informs me you and Mr. K decided to do some snooping earlier tonight. He followed you and saw you climb the wall. Craigie's insane. That is a matter of opinion, Mr. Doherty. Craigie, what is this? Perhaps my assistant, Dr. Grimshaw, would be good enough to explain. Assistant? Yes. You see, I am the actual head of the Grimshaw Sanatorium. Grimshaw? Count Craigie feigns many delusions, Mr. Doherty, but in this case, he's telling the truth. Count Craigie is actually Professor Ernst Hassler. You and your friend, Mr. K, will discover their exact nature very shortly, Mr. Doherty. It's a magnificent opportunity to serve science. Then I passed out. And the next thing I knew, I was coming to in a different room. I guessed it was somewhere in the charity building because of the angle of the sun through the windows. They had me in a straitjacket and kept doping me until I lost count of time. I, I don't know how long it kept up. I remember one day being wheeled along a corridor into an operating room and hearing the voices of Boyna, Grimshaw, and Crakey as if from a great distance. Pituitrin. Pituitrin. Four cc's. Four cc's. How are the measurements? Reducing rapidly. We'll operate at once. If Boyna start the anesthesia. All right, doctor. Commence. <laughs> I came to again, I had a blinding headache. And after that wore off a horrible sensation of weakness. I began to wonder if Craigie and Grimshaw weren't doing something to drive me insane because I lost all sense of perspective. The room seemed to grow in size. I don't know how much time passed, but one day Grimshaw came into the room with a bundle in his arms about the size of a newborn baby. The bundle was my friend, Arthur K. Good morning, Mr. Doherty. I brought you a companion. I'm sure you two gentlemen will enjoy each other's company. Let me out of you. I couldn't believe my eyes until Grimshaw sat Arthur down on the bed beside me. It was then that I got the real shock. For I realized that what had looked like a tiny bundle in Grimshaw's arms was actually the same size that I was. Then... Disappointed, gentlemen. Do you not feel privileged to be a part of an experiment that will place me at the very top rank of the world's endocrinologists? What are you doing to us? 
It has been long established, gentlemen, that dwarfism and giantism result from injury to or malfunction of the pituitary and thyroid glands. The interlock between these glands was thought to be a hormone. I have discovered that this was incorrect. It is an enzyme, an enzyme I isolated some years ago. I was well on the way to synthesis in Germany when the surrender interrupted me. The interruption also limited the number and type of subjects on whom I could experiment. I was forced to find others. Such as Harvard Ward. Mr. Ward was only a control experiment. And now you've done the same to us. No. that followed were a living nightmare. A nightmare from which Arthur and I awoke for brief periods to find ourselves in a strange new world. A huge, frightening world where everything was enlarged a hundred times. When we finally emerged, we found ourselves imprisoned in a tiny mouse cage. Judging by the relative size of things, we could not have been more than five inches tall. Now that our senses cleared, we realized that the experiment was at an end. That from now on, it was either escape or be destroyed.
This is the record found in a fountain pen cover in the burned-out hallway of Grimshaw Sanatorium. There is nothing to add except that the fire which destroyed the sanatorium and killed so many of its occupants, including Dr. Grimshaw and Dr. Voina, was definitely of incendiary origin. It is believed by the fire chief that some small creature, either a mouse or possibly a cat, chewed the insulation off the wire and short-circuited the system. The two patients, John Doherty and Arthur Kay, vanished completely after the fire, and their remains were never found. Whether the manuscript which you have just heard is authentic, or whether it was the work of one of the more demented inmates of the sanatorium, we leave to your judgment. You have just heard another adventure into the unknown world of the future. The world of... Dimension X. Next week on Dimension X, and the moon be still as bright. The story of the first despoilers of the planet Mars... The men from Earth. Tonight, Dimension X has transcribed Dr. Grimshaw's Sanatorium. Adapted for radio by George Lefferts from an original short story by Fletcher Pratt. Featured in the cast were Carl Weber as John Doherty and Roger DeCoven as Arthur Kay. Your narrator was Norman Rose. Music by Albert Berman. Engineer, Bill Chambers. Dimension X is directed by Edward King. Your National Guard is a strong, well-knit military organization of men from every state and territory in the nation. No matter what emergency faces our country, a National Guardsman has ensured his future. He's trained to handle himself if the going gets tough. And at the same time, he's learned new skills to help his civilian career. Regular Army and Air Force pay scales apply to every hour of training a guardsman takes. So men, if you're over 17, join the National Guard. Keep your guard up. Enjoy Bob Hope and Groucho Marx, coming soon on NBC. Mm.